This show is sponsored by the Comics Shop. We hope you enjoy the show. G'day. Hello and welcome to episode seven of Tuesday Chinwag. I'm Lee Chalker from Battle for Bustle and this is Mr. Gary Shaliner. And how are you, sir? I'm very well under the circumstances, yes. yes. I'm totally fine. You're looking well over there? Oh, you know, I'm uh, trying to stay out of the sun and, uh, you know, like uh, do all those healthy things, mate. So g'day, Nick. And... Uh, yeah, no, great pleasure to have you on the show tonight, mate. I've been looking forward to this one. So, um, yeah. You've been I, uh, threatening it for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, I, I guess what got you got you on is like those 5,000 emails that I sent you and, you know, like all that, uh, all those letters in the mail and, you know, coming home and this letter just poured out of the mailbox, you know, and you just thought. Well, like, it's better oh, doing this yeah. than getting that restraining order filled out. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll stop then. <laughs> yeah, like, you stay up there, I'll stay down here and it's all okay. Yeah, yeah, never to cross the Queensland border sort of thing, you know. <laughs> well, between, two states between us, so that's, that's, yeah. that's a safe difference. Oh, you'll be safe, you'll be safe, you know. It's like I'll probably walk to air and then turn around, you know, and like forget what I was coming down that way for anyway, so... So, how you been, mate? What's um, what's doing? Well, um, chugging away here. I was hoping by this show, because uh, we've had this planned for you know a few weeks now, that uh, mm. I'd have some news um, to about Adventure Illustrated Number Two, which I'm still working on. Uh, the tail end of that, it's getting pretty bloody close to being finished. But uh, you know, the old health issues that I've been going through have. have just slot the long the loose end drags you know the, the ending of the project so i'm just trying to get that finished at the moment and i was hoping hoping against hope that i have it finished by this show as a bit of a deadline but it just mm. hasn't happened because uh you know the the, the parkinson's has, has really thrown me for a bit of a loop as far as productivity is concerned so uh i'd just like to uh send out my uh, apologies to people that are waiting on the second issue it will happen and it's getting there Hopefully it's going to go to the printers in the next uh, in a couple of weeks. But, um, yeah, it's been a very, very strange uh, couple of years sort of overlapping the whole COVID that everyone's been experiencing, but uh, the, the whole Parkinson's road that I've been on. Uh, so I thought I'd sort of take the opportunity to maybe talk through that a little bit just to, you know, explain where I'm at physically and, and mentally as well as far as still doing comics and uh, the plans for the future as well. So uh, if that's okay with you, I might take a couple of minutes just to, to tell that background. You go ahead, mate. Um, well, when did um, COVID first kick in? That was uh, early 2020, was it? Yeah, early 2020, yep. 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 So um, I do work at Mona, which is the uh, museum down here in Hobart. I work there as a supervisor. And they had decided to close the museum when COVID really kicked in. Uh, I think it was around March 2020. And so, uh, you know, I was still, you know, you get the, what was the job keeper, was it? So I was at home working away and I was doing some yard work, uh, pulling out some blackberry bushes. And I thought I'd overdone it. And I had started to develop a bit of a, a tremor in the right arm. And uh, I thought I'd just overdone it. And over the next couple of days, this tremor in the arm wouldn't go away. Uh, so I went down to the docks and uh, she said straight away, well, it, it seems Parkinsonian to me. And I thought, you know, what the bloody hell, you know, Parkinsonian. So she recommended I go off and get some tests. And it started this very long process of uh, MRI scans and CAT scans and talking to neurologists and trying to find out uh, why I had developed because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still relatively young for someone who has been diagnosed with Parkinson's, but, uh, you know, they thought, geez, um, it's an early onset Parkinson's job. So try, struggling through the, the um, mire of a diagnosis was uh, very hard. 
and I had um, already finished, uh, let's see, where was I? Uh, I produced Adventure Illustrated 1 uh, and there was a sign signing going to be done at the end of 2020 at King's Comics. But by that stage, my arm was going crazy. My right hand side of my body was just shaking uncontrollably and I couldn't get much artwork done at all because I hadn't been medicated properly because there was no diagnosis of mm. Parkinson's. What was throwing them was that one of the MRI scans was showing some scar tissue on the brain on the wrong side of the brain. And they're going, what's this, what's this scar tissue all about here? If he's got Parkinson's, he should have uh, you know, signals or, or um, uh, signals in the scan or items on the scan that indicate uh, the right hand side is going to be affected. So uh, they couldn't work out where all this brain scarring came from. I could tell them ages ago that I was brain damaged. But anyway, uh, so it was throwing up a bit of a, um, a fog as far as the diagnosis was concerned. So they ended up getting this professor in who's uh, you know, a big deal with uh, um, Parkinson's and MS, multiple scler sclerosis in particular. And for a while there, they actually thought it might have been a dual diagnosis of both MS and Parkinson's at the same time. And I was there for about six months. I was going, nah, that, that's, that's the worst possible outcome that I could ask for. Uh, so they brought in this professor to look at my case and he's an MS specialist. And he uh, defined after going through a spinal tap and going through another MRI that the scar tissue that was uh, that they were confused about it was quite old. It was very old damage. <laughs> like I've been damaged since I've been a kid. <laughs> so he was he was happy to remove that from the table of diagnosis, which uh, allowed for a clearer diagnosis of Parkinson's. So um, that was by the time that happened. It was about July 2021 uh, last year. And uh, I had started work on the second issue of Adventure Illustrated, thinking that, oh, well, it's early days in, part, in the Parkinson's diagnosis. I'd still be able to be fast enough to do the Kickstarter, get the issue finished and all that kind of stuff by, by Christmas. And it just hasn't happened. It's just turned out that the, 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 uh, my ability to draw so far hasn't been diminished in quality, but it's just purely in speed. Uh, the shaking hands, uh, just of course, when you're doing detailed inking, uh, makes it that much harder. And some days uh, you, you just can't even pick up a pencil. So, you know, I've actually got, I've just got a new purchase, uh, which is uh, this little doodad here, which is like a splint that you put on your uh, your finger that stops uh -huh. the hand shaking. It's sort of, a, it sort of gives it a, um, some support there so that I can actually, um, you know, ink without without the hand spasming like at the yeah. moment i've got spasms shooting down my right hand side and my right hand is uh not not stopping like it's it's shaking all the time so yeah. if any any artists out there realize when you're penciling and when you're inking you, you need that fine motor control and that's what i just don't have so in finishing off this issue um it's on a day-to-day -day basis on whether my right hand side of my body can actually stay um solid enough or firm enough to be able to work through things so um this is a tool that i got shipped to me last week and they're really hard to get and they're quite expensive for a bit of molded plastic but uh what you do is actually you clip in your uh your pencil fits into the device like that yep. and you put your finger through there and and it yep. allows you to hold a pen and it stops your finger spasming and that's where yeah. the problem was trying to get the uh the, the control back into your inking so and my art style of course um <laughs> you know over the years you developed or i've developed a an art style that sort of is reliant on smooth constant lines outlines and uh feathering detail so um you know i've been trying to maintain that quality and maintain that uh standard so that it still still looks like a page done by gary challoner um of course when it doesn't uh it messes with your headspace as well so uh there's been a lot of days where i've gone is this it do i walk away from the drawing board with an issue you know four fifths done and uh you know i i can't finish there has been days where i really felt like just turning around and walking but i've realized that it's uh it's an assessment that has to be made on a day-to-day -day basis some days um my hand doesn't shake at all and uh i can get quite a lot of stuff done um, and of course, being on the computer is a different set of muscles to being on the drawing board. The drawing board is the big thing. 
So I suppose there's an option that I could go digital, but I've tried to refrain. I think you'd still have the same problems with holding a pen, holding a drawing pen on a tablet would have the same kind of uh, you know, shaky issues like that. That's my hand relaxing at the moment, and that's the, the shake I've got. Part of that's because I'm actually online and talking to you, uh, a little bit nervous and what have you. But um, you know, on, a, on any given day, I've got to try and control that and it's only going to get worse as the Parkinson's develops over the years. So um, that's what's holding up Adventure Illustrated 2. Um, and uh, it'll it'll happen, but it'll just be a matter of when I physically can do it. And I've had offers from friends, you know, artist friends saying, hey, I'll, I'll ink the story to finish things off. And that is all is a, a, is a great option, but it's, that's not what it's about. It's about, you know, I wanted to do Adventure Illustrated as a showcase for for my stuff as well and it could still happen where at the end of the day i'll get people to come in and finish off pages for me but at the moment it's one of the hardest things i've had to do and it's a mental challenge and a physical challenge and i'd like to get this issue finished the way i would like it to be finished for future issues i'm, I'm happy to compromise as much as i physically can to get other issues out i still have plans for adventure illustrated three and four onwards you know for next year and as well as other projects but um, you know, this one is just—it's um, you know, a real deal breaker. And I, if I don't, if I don't finish it uh, <laughs> myself, I think I'll, uh, you know, put the head through a window or something. But uh, yeah, so that's that's what I've been working on. Each day is a, a question of where am I at physically, where am I at mentally, and uh, getting some artwork finished. And I'm still—I'm very happy with what's being done. I'm very proud of the issue as it's coming together. Um, what I am disappointed about as well is that Tim McEwen, who is a, a contributor with Greener Pastures as uh, the third story in the issue, has been so severely affected by this as well with, you know, the we had plans of having so many issues out by now, and that has just basically got out the window. So um, he's been amazing and, and very supportive of, uh, you know, the, the circumstances and, you uh, uh, I, I just, you know, more, more power to him. And I, I know for a fact that based on what's happened over the last 12, 18 months, um, he's made plans to, in 2023 next year, to really um, um, jump off into the deep end with his greener pastures uh, material uh, without Adventure Illustrated. He'll go off and do his own thing. And, you know, like, certainly he, he shouldn't wait for me because I'll, <laughs> I'll be taken forever. So, uh, so look out for next year for greener pastures coming back in a big way but uh just for sticking with me for the first two issues and sticking with me through the uh the last and final year of the ledger awards that he and i coordinated together uh i think just uh yeah he's uh, an amazing bloke and uh you know i'm sorry it's turned out the way it has and i know that i shouldn't need to or have to apologize but you're still you're still human and you still know that your plans were derailed and it was by events that you may not have had any control of, but it still is disappointing to not um, see things reach fruition the way you would have liked them to. The end. Mm. That would have, um, yeah, that's powerful stuff, mate. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that's, uh, yeah, I, I could only imagine, look, I couldn't imagine, to be honest with you, um, the difficulties is someone that enjoys drawing myself that you would be going through right now, mate. So my heart is with you in that regards. But um, you're a fighter, mate. You're not giving up. You're sticking to. Um... I'm, I'm sticking to it, but it's just it's just disappointing where you have a Kickstarter campaign. You have people expecting things. Uh, I know that there is a lot of support out there, and that's been you know invaluable in in keeping me going. Uh, and uh, I mean. It, I don't mean it in a wrong way when I say it's only when when it compares to your health, it's only a comic book, but it's it represents a lot more now. It represents um, my my mental ability uh, and my uh, tenacity in seeing whether I can uh, draw for as long as I possibly can to a standard that I'm I'm happy with. I don't mind walking away from the drawing board um, in due course. I just don't want to do it yet. I've still got things that I want to do um drawing wise that uh you know i don't want this to take take away from me uh any sooner than i'm mentally prepared for 
and mm. uh, it, it's been hard on my family as well. So it's uh, a whole readjustment of plans that Tim and I were, had made, uh, you know, for the the next year, the next couple of years. And what what I wanted to do with Cyclone Comics and with the the creative IPs that I have, uh, that's all been thrown out the window and has and has had to be reassembled again in a plan that is under the structure of well, how how able are you to move forward with this so everything's like sliding a bit some things completely have been taken off the uh the table like i've had to give up being the publisher uh, of dark nebula and helping tad put that together and uh, he uh, thankfully has found a, a a perfect home in reverie publications for his dark nebula but yep. he's been um you know with me along this this ride as well all in while trying to relaunch his new title so there was a whole stick in the spokes there as well um and the future of um a few other you know projects that some of them are still on the drawing board and we'll see completion but uh some long term longer term plans have really some of them have gone off the, the schedule completely because i just will never ever realistically get to them so a lot of reassessment that's that's for sure a lot of reassessment yeah it certainly would be um a lot of adjustment too mate you know like to uh change your lifestyle and stuff like that as well you know i can um, only assume so it's uh, uh yeah 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 there's, there's there's been a lot of uh change over the last couple of years in uh um uh, yeah in, in a lot of things it's you never expect of course you never expect this kind of thing to happen and a lot of uh, it could be a lot worse but still it's just it's annoying enough to adjust your life and the decisions you have to make uh, enough to be just a huge, you know, pain in the bum, but uh, you just have to stay nimble. What do we talk about the uh, the way, you know, like the comic book way, mm -hmm. just keep your head down, your bum up, keep your knees mm -hmm. bent a little bit so you can move a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right when the yep. crap happens and uh, just stay nimble and, uh, you know, stay flexible. So, I often, uh, I often am, uh, you know, like in situations where I come back to your advice about the way, mate. So it's, uh, I found it hasn't just helped me, you know, like withdrawing and comic books and stuff. I've also felt it, um, it's, you know, it's presence at certain decisions that have happened outside of uh, comics too. So that's, um, yeah, it is, it is cool. Always got to stay nimble, always get ready. You know, like I never know what's going to happen. Yeah, and stuff. Be, be prepared for the worst. That that mm. whole adage about be prepared for the worst, but uh, you know, expect the best and try for the best. Um, yep. And you know, the, the best outcome in any kind of publishing, you know, whether it's Australian comics or anything else, is to stay focused on what you've got to do creatively you know, as an artist or as a writer. Stay focused on what you've got to do. Uh, don't worry too much about the rest of the crap that happens around your your um, headspace stay focused keep your head down and your bum up and get the project done because uh, you, you're not a cartoonist uh, unless you get something published uh, you know like you're only as good as your last project and uh, yeah you, you, you got to get that stuff done you got to get it um, started and finished and stay focused um, and you know you're a perfect example of that getting battle for bustle up and running and uh, you know lately you've been telling me about how good you've been going with the fifth issue and it's just it's just great that's exactly it don't worry about what's happening with anyone else's title don't worry what's happening about anyone else's dramas that they're going through just you know get this get your stuff done and get the next issue out because otherwise you'll just be left behind well you've given me a lot of great advice over the last period mate that's um been super helpful for me too and um with utmost respect man um and for what you've gone through and stuff you've um, always had the time for me to you know throw me an answer out mate even um you know as, as mundane as the question is from me in the face of you know what you're going up against mate so thank you very very much for that because uh yeah well, uh, you know I, I i've said what i've said less as uh a, a, a whinge or it's more just an explanation and a reason why things have slowed down i think a lot of people were owed a little bit more of an explanation as to what's happening mm -hmm. with me and uh you know i've tried to um you know stay off social media a little bit just try to stay focused on getting this stuff done and you know you have your up up days and your down days and on the down days you think that you're letting everyone down and and you're not it's just you know like you want to get a page done you want to get a panel done and you can't so of course you get into a bit of a funk about it but it also plays into the it shows that i'm still um 
keen to get this issue finished. So I'm still invested in it, mm. and uh, and I'm invested in telling more stories down the track as well. So um, uh, that's a good, that's a good sign. That's a good sign that uh, the the important thing is uh, not to, to to give up and to see the end result. Uh, so I'm I'm going to be pretty pretty chuffed when I get this thing off the presses. That's for sure. Oh be, man, uh, I reckon with that with this one that you get to the presses, would that be one of those, like, in your time span doing comic books and stuff, would that be the one that you're most proud of at this point for what you've yeah, had to go yeah, through? Yeah, it'll definitely be, be up there as a highlight of, uh, you know, like, it's it's so close now, but it's like you, you're drunk, jumping in a lake and you can't turn back now. You've got to keep on swimming to the other side. You've got to keep on swimming. You can see the shore, you just have to keep on swimming. So, you know. Um, and you'll get to the other side eventually. And uh, you know, even when I didn't have parkies and I'm a slow enough artist as it is anyway, the best of times, but uh, there was a saying that I'd heard from someone that, uh, you know, they'll, they won't remember if it was late. Well, you know, not too late, but they won't remember that it's late, but they'll remember if it's bad or if it's sloppy or if it's rushed. So as long as you can produce an item that you're proud quality-wise to, to show someone, I think that's the key, um, uh, particularly in comics. And when you sh shrink that down, particularly in Australian comics, Australian comics, uh, you know, you don't have the, the monthly deadline grind or anything like that. You don't have the corporate need to have something out every month. So what do you have? You have the need to be good. You have the need to be uh, professionally produced, to have the story being fantastic, to have the artwork being fantastic, the print quality and all those other things. Uh, mm -hmm. If you can't have a monthly regular title when you do release something just make sure it's good to the best of your ability mm. Mm. and there have right. been there's been too many projects that where i've succumbed to the need to get it done quickly uh and regretted it so um you know I, I try not to do that anymore even with the parkinson's if you were to remove that from the whole equation i was still going to approach the the material that i'm working on now from a make sure it's good don't make sure it's on time but you can be late just make sure it's good. Yeah. Is um, Have you rushed things in the past due to um, just wanting to get it out? You know what I mean? Like just um, uh, yeah, a bit generally younger been, and kind of lay the track. Been, generally been editorial pressure. Yeah. Um, one of the things that came to mind was <laughs> when I was doing Breckenridge Elkins uh, for Dark Horse, they were, I was doing an adaption of a Robert E. Howard character called Breckenridge Elkins who was a big goofy cowboy. Yeah. And uh, Dark Horse, one, I was running it online and I was doing it under my own schedule of a page a week or a page a fortnight. And then um, they expressed interest in reprinting all of the web stuff, but I hadn't finished the story. I still had, uh, I don't know, 10 pages or something to go. And they wanted the uh, the artwork for the print edition like fairly quickly. So I thought, yeah, you know, they said, can, can it be done for this issue that has a deadline of here, you know, X? And I said, yeah, sure, here, yeah, no problems. And it just turned into a the most bizarre all night. The family were working on colours and there was artwork everywhere. And the and this, this editor from Dark Horse was going, I need it by this time. And I was doing the, the time clock and was going, okay, so he needs it by 5 a.m. where I am, 5 a.m. Perth time. And it'll be open up there at 9 o'clock. It'll be Dark Horse over in Portland. And so, uh, and he had a like a drop box to, for me to drop the artwork into digitally, you know, like a, uh, drop off and pick up so that he can get it when he comes into the office. And I was going a thousand miles an hour trying to get this thing done. And I had my stepson, I had my wife, all hands on deck, sort of proofreading and lettering and, and rubbing out lines. And I was coloring and oh, it got done, but it got done with about, you know, he got into the office and all the pages were there at bar one where I was working on. And he goes, Where's this last page? And he goes, <laughs> oh, ten more minutes, ten more minutes. You got tell I'm going to go for a coffee when I come back. It's got to go to the printers. And you know, like, <laughs> I was that close. I said, you know, I was texting you and I was going, okay, it's going, it's going, it's going. And the last page finally came through about half an hour late. But and that's after that. I mean, that's happened to me a couple of times in my career. And after that, I just said to myself, never again, never <laughs> again. It's a young man's sport doing a work through, and it's a young man's sport sort of trying that, uh, doing that uh, workload. It's just not worth it. It's not worth it. I'm still was was happy with the result for that Breckenridge Elkins story, but it 
could have been so much better if uh, I, I had uh, taken my, my time. But, you know, Dark Horse is Dark Horse. And when they have a deadline and, they, and a print production deadline and they need something to buy something, they don't care what you're going through. They just want the artwork. Yeah. So. They just want, mate, you get it to me when I asked you to, eh? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's so, crazy. Uh, yeah, there's been a couple of uh, fun adventures like that in my professional career. So, uh, you know, I'm too stupid to have learned. I should say no a hell of a lot more often. Uh, but, uh, you know, hey. Oh, I mean, I, I, I would say that you're probably, um, you know, from what the viewers and myself know now, um, judging from your drive, you know, like and um, – your ambition and stuff like that you would have been like a, back when you were younger and you know what i mean like just learning and wanting to get into comic books and all that you would have been a well-driven dude mate trying uh, to do well everything driven, just never fast enough <laughs> just yeah. never never fast enough not not commercially uh fast to a speed where i could hold down a regular title uh never was that fast and that's that's a bit of a problem and i don't know how um modern artists reconcile the amount of detail that is required in a marvel or dc comic these days because my style is fairly you know cartoony so you know i can get away with a certain amount of uh you know lack of detailing backgrounds or whatever and take shortcuts or uh you know as a writer i can even cover up a whole blank area of a panel knowing that it's all going to be words so i don't have to draw anything there so it'll be a huge word balloon if i'm writing and lettering the story myself um, yeah. But you, know, you pick up any standard Batman comic these days, and the work that goes into it is just incredible. You know, whether you like that stuff or not, it's not to my taste. But uh, you know, the, the the detail in modern comics is is absolutely staggering. So I can see why there's a a large burnout of uh, of, of artists that sort of can only stay on a title for eight or nine issues, and then they need a break and they sort of wander away and do something else. You know? Um, yeah, yeah. It's hard. A lot of there were a lot of long um, runs back in the day, weren't they? And, you know, like your John Romita yeah, Jr. and all his John stuff. John Romita Jr. I was about to say, as a good example of someone who had, had a very simple style and he, but his sense of design uh, was key and, and it made all of his storytelling jump off the page. But he had a very simple style and was allowed to, to churn those pages um, effectively. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I love his stuff uh, as a as a stylist, I reckon he's great. Um, but I do feel sorry for um, the the artists that sell themselves as someone who can do a lot of detail. And uh, you know, maybe well, maybe they they're used to that kind of pressure and 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 skill. But uh, it always I, I look at it in awe at some of the stuff that's done on modern superhero comics these days, and how they can keep that standard up is incredible um yeah yeah and i know um like when i did an issue of astro city uh a fillion issue uh, i thought oh this is my chance to try and replicate that modern superhero feel and i was lucky enough to have a, a, an inca who um wayne von Grawbadger was his name but he's he's worked with the best pencilers over in the states so i was really quite keen to see what he would do and, and he did lift my work incredibly but uh, you know, after doing that one issue of Astro City, it was like oh, I don't. If I couldn't do twelve of these, you know, plus an annual or whatever, the you know, there's no way. Filling an issue was fine for me. I'll just go back to my, you know, stories the way I like to tell them. You know? Oh, I still would be still, still cool to tell people you did an issue with Astro City, mate. I remember oh. when Astro City off the shelves when it first came out long ago. But who was the writer? Kurt. Kurt Busick. Music, yeah, that's yeah. him. And the artist was um, Brent Anderson Brent from Anderson. Memphis, yeah, who yeah. did um, God Loves Man Kills and stuff, the X Men yeah. graphic novel back yeah. in the eighties. Oh, yeah, no, that uh, that yeah, that was. Um, I first yeah, stumbled yeah. onto him uh, doing Kazar or Kazar, I think, uh, when it was um, a direct market only back in the days when the direct market first kicked in, and there was titles like uh, Kazar and. Uh, a few other things that you can only get in the comic shops, and Brent Anderson was uh, doing that then, and that's before I think he did the X Men graphic novel. But uh, yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's a great artist, and of course you get the uh, Alex Ross covers on Astro City as well, the, the painted mm. covers, mm. and uh, yeah, Alex Ross, yeah, what a what a great artist he is. 
uh, yes, yeah, it, it so. turns them out too. That bloke, it's um, unbelievable when you see like the new drawings, uh, paintings, and stuff he does too. But uh, yeah, no, he's he's good, all right. But hey, mate, what was your um, what was your thinking back on it? What was your one comic book that you you loved and you hold on to dearly now that you first collected? Oh, that I first collected. Ah. Well, I came up through the ranks in the 70s reading Marvel comics. So uh, I think Master of Kung Fu by uh, Galacy was a, a mm -hmm. prime cut and uh, taken over by uh, Gene Day and then Mike Zeck as well. So that, that sequence of artists stayed fairly strong. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Billy Graham uh, run with Rich Buckler of uh, Don McGregor's Panther's Rage in Jungle Action, the, the Black Panther stuff that influences the movie so much um so that that was i got the original issues of that and that was at the time as well when the marvel monsters were happening i know that's making a big comeback at the moment the uh werewolf by night a halloween special is coming out soon but uh so werewolf by night tomb of dracula um you know ghost rider to a certain extent you know swamp thing all those kind of characters so it was yeah. a big one for the uh, the old uh, universal monster movies so uh, when marvel got inspired and started doing Dracula and Frankenstein and the mummy and all that sort of stuff. That sort of uh, hit me right between the eye as well. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, well, that's uh, that's great adventure stuff, isn't it? You know? Yeah, like, it all gets sort of wrapped into um, what I'm doing or what I have always wanted to do with the Jackaroo character as well. Yeah. But you, you don't know that you're the, the sum of your influences sometimes, that you, you think, oh, well, I'm going to sit down and do an adventure character and mm -hmm. you know, after five or six years of writing stories, you turn around and realise that it's not really an adventure character. There's a lot of other themes and, and kind of influences you're playing with here, you know, uh, and, I, and I invent a character like uh, Morton Stone, which was uh, supposed to be a black humour character, but it, it gave me an entranceway into the world of monsters and, and supernatural, and I'm starting to realise that I'm, I'm dipping back into Master of Kung Fu, I'm dipping back into Werewolf by Night, I'm dipping back into all of these early influences you know even yeah. the frank rosetta conan paintings and, and things like that i mean all these stuff that you absorb as a child of course comes out in your work as an adult but sometimes mm. you just don't realize it so yeah um, it's been interesting you know getting to to be an older bloke turning around going you didn't realize this i mean you're an idiot gary of course that's what you're trying to do of course that's where this character is coming from and you know like so you know it's been exciting planning uh, over the last five years a bit of a, um, a continuation of the Jackaroo character uh, that I hopefully will sort of get going next year. That's that's the major project that I want out um, after um, Adventure Illustrated is, um, you know, a soft relaunch or a continuation of the Jackaroo because uh, there's so many things that were left undone when, um, you know, Cyclone uh, split in, back in the day and I uh, got overseas work and I was never able to get back into the Jackaroo character. So um, that's one of the big things I'd like to get to. Uh, with, the, with the knowledge now as uh, being the age I am and looking back at what I started trying to do with the Jackaroo, how I can continue it on now uh, quite successfully and happily and, and ring all those bells and, and tick all those boxes of things that I've always wanted to do in, in, uh, in comics. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, you know, if my hand allows. No, it will mean I, I think if not, I'm giving it out for people to uh, to do the artwork and I'll just write the stories. <laughs> well, Hayden just sent a little uh, thing in there, man, that said uh, you're the sum of your influences is such an interesting thought. And uh, it certainly is. Uh, yeah, whether you like it or not sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, now, would I be right in saying that... Um, the Jackaroo is, uh, you know, you've had some, you've had some big creations over the years, man. But the Jackaroo, like from talking to you and stuff, that seems to be your baby for. Yeah, yeah that's my baby. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The world of the Jackaroo is is uh, a very expansive one, and I've always um, regret isn't the right word, but I've always wanted to get back into uh, and showing readers. What the character had the potential to be that i never felt that it was uh met uh you know back in the day with cyclone it was 
it was starting to to be fleshed out and to actually get to the some of the potential that was uh that was there for the character but uh he's so much more than what people uh may assume he's not just a spirit ripoff or a two-fisted uh, crocodile dundee kind of person there's, there's there's only a few people actually that i've divulged the 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 big picture with uh mm -hmm. jack keegan and uh and uh, and i want to keep it in, like under wraps so that the surprises can can unfurl accordingly but um that sort of goes what i'm trying to say what am i trying to say here that uh the, the character uh, needs uh, need, uh, needs some attention and some love now. That back in the day, I may have been only perceived as a uh, as an artist, um, but now I'm tending to the Jackaroo not just as a an artwork, but as a as a writer and as a creator as well. So, um, and I'm seasoned enough now to be able to pour a lot of great ideas uh, into the character. So even if I can't draw the Jackaroo and I give the stories out for artists to, to, to draw for me, uh, I'd still be creatively satisfied now because I'm wearing the writer's hat more so than being known as an artist as well. I don't know whether I'm being clear in my... Yeah, um, no, you are. I've always thought you're a great writer, man, um, from your early stuff and all that. I, I'm surprised that you, that you feel that you're more of an artist than a writer because uh, I think your writing's strong, dude. Well, it's just the perception you get as you know people comment and 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 the gigs you get. I mean, you get overseas jobs as an artist and not as a writer. So uh, you sort of uh, you you just make some assumptions about yourself, I suppose, that um, um, you know, may be incorrect. But uh, I'm trying to now set that to right that um, you know I can I I can be a writer. Um, there's actually a project I've got uh, that I'd like to do for next year that is again on the cards, uh, where the Jackaroo is uh, in a prose story that uh, Glenn Lumsden is doing some spot illustrations for, and and the cover. Um, so that hopefully will come out next year, and that again is more of a th that this decision to do a prose story happened before the Parkinson's diagnosis, but it was in an effort to strengthen my um, writing skills and how that will play into um you know the the other comics that the other uh, jackaroo are in as well so it's it's time to develop jackaroo as an ip is i suppose the 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 short version of what i'm trying to say and uh, i'm looking forward to that it's like saying no to a lot of other things um working on adventure illustrated for my other characters like morton stone and cyclone force which plays into the jackaroo world as well they're all sort of part of that a larger jackaroo uh universe and um hopefully uh next year we'll get to see some new jackaroo uh issues proper to continue the story and develop things um the way that i've always wanted it to be developed um you, you're probably the same with uh, battle for bustle with uh uh notes and bibles and stories and filling up files and you just need to draw it now you just need to draw it and get it out there well i'm yeah. in the same situation with the jackaroo is that He's not who you think he is. He's not the kind of character that you think he is, but he's also going to be the sum of like everything that I've learned in my career uh, so far. Um, and it's just going to, you know, be hopefully surprising and entertaining because um, it's horrible to be stale in the comic biz. Oh, mate, I, I'm sure it's going to be awesomely exciting, mate. Like, uh, that's great. He's a cool character. So, hey, this is uh, Rick Smith. Um, now, he says, uh, hi, Gary, what Outback pub did you use as photo reference for the multi-shot setup in the Jackaroo story? Shots from different angles or was it all imagination? It was all imagination. I uh, woke up and it was all a dream. Uh, <laughs> no, no, uh, that pub I, uh, I made up, uh, it was lo basically loose, uh, loosely based on the uh, Edamoga pub. The, the the wonky outback yep, pub that was yep. in the old australasian post magazine the cartoons yep. uh by was it who drew those things oh molnar i can't remember the artist but i know i've been to that pub down in new south southern new south wales or somewhere it's uh yeah, out in yeah. the middle of nowhere here's that pub yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, just uh, doing some uh, very loose research about uh, old buildings and things like that. 
but the actual Daga Daga pub uh, is is a an original creation. So uh, same with the you know the the positioning of the rusty uh, ute that's slowly uh, de-evolving into the dirt out front of the pub, and that's funny how you know things that you draw a lot you just you can you don't need reference after a while you sort of I do know uh, the layout of the building and uh, what angle to draw it from and yeah it's it's uh, you know not too hard to draw from memory now so yeah but that's uh, one thing that was just an invention I got to now think about it, the rest of the town uh, that's that's the the funny thing I mean the reader has seen it from this direction, but what happens if you were to look around the other way? What's on the other side of the road from the Dugga Dugga pub, you know? So uh, that will all be revealed further down the track. <laughs> hey, um, <clears throat> with um, the, the, particularly the Jackaroo, now like I'm a fan of your artwork and um, <clears throat> I do have to say though that I, I would think for me that image of the Jackaroo where the blinds are behind him and the lights coming through him that um now that's an image to me that's iconic like that is man i look at that and i'm like whoa what was what was your story behind that one because you know like you're always searching for a ripper cover you know like in your mind and stuff like what was that, well, that, that that comes from the old black and white films i suppose there's a dollop of frank miller in there as well mm -hmm. um but you know at the time i think it was around the same time that miller was doing sin city uh so that's probably where the the uh the blinds the stripy blinds came from mm -hmm. but the, the moody uh you know the, the dark inks uh thick inking and feathering um you know stems right back to will eisner as well i suppose so it's a combination of uh you know of influences there uh, yeah, but but um, yeah, moody noir uh, is is the go for that one. Uh, the 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 jackaroo is a um, an, an interesting combination. Uh, he, he's a guy that allows me to go from you know bright daylight in Dugga Dugga to uh, dark shadows of the city uh, in in Sydney in Kings Cross, and uh, that that's what I love about him is that he's he he allows me to 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 um, illustrate or to tell stories in whatever mood I'm in and it all just still works. So yeah. um, he's a, um, a good character to be able to, to um, give me flexibility. I can practically do any kind of story with him and uh, it would kind of make sense. So Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Hey, um, just quickly, I saw a little comment pop up there too and it was Dave Dyer letting us know that the Edamoga pub um, cartoonist name was ken maynard ah that's it maynard yeah ken maynard. i was going for molnar but that was another thank you, Dave. maynard yeah thank you very much yeah, yeah so and with these um big crows with the boots wearing the boots the crows that would fly over the pub and things like that so you know that was my you know initial <laughs> initial uh, influence I, I suppose um but uh you know a little bit of research here and there plus having traveled around a little bit in the country, you get to, these these buildings have um, a kind of look to them really. So mm. um, it's, it's a vibe, it's a it's a feeling, uh, the, the great Aussie pub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, even just out and, <clears throat> cause I've spent a lot of time traveling like out West Queensland, New South Wales and stuff in particular. And there, there really are places that are like that out there, you know, like the uh, little towns are on a, on a rail line the railway doesn't go through there anymore and the little town's still there and the yep. buildings are those wonky shapes and have that great character to them and stuff you know yep. Like, yep. Uh, don't uh, don't tell my wife about rusty stuff she'll just load up the boot with uh railway nails and and lengths of railway track and old timbers and you name it she'll just put it in the back of the car and drive it all home so <laughs> a collector uh, yeah, she'd, she'd take a whole country town and bring it home and set it up in the backyard. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, let that, um, I get flowers and branches, mate. I get told, quick, pull the car up and like run across, jump a fence and run across the park and bring back big palm fronds, you know what I mean? And then you're in my car. It's like, uh, yeah, I don't know how I get away with it on main roads, mate. You know, like and there's <laughs> people that they, they have controls for that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't been caught yet, so it's, um, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, uh, 
the things you do, eh? Like mm. funny and funny stories. Speak, speaking of Dugga Dugga, a little bit of uh, trivia. Uh, it's actually named after a sound effect in a Phil Barlow Zooniverse comic. There mm. was a, um, a rubber-headed character that was being uh, pulled through a vice or something, and their head sort of flopped forward, and the sound effect was... Dugga, 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 dugga. And, uh, <laughs> and what, the way the way Phil had lettered it, uh, it just was uh, superb. So uh, I decided to name the the, uh, the, the town Dugga Dugga to, uh, in, in honour of a nice sound effect. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. That's a cool name. It's uh, yeah, it is. You know, I like it. It works. It works heaps. It's uh, man, like when you, um, I guess. When you first got your first American work, international stuff, what um, what was that like for you? Because uh, you know you would have been plying your wares with Cyclone and your characters in Australia and stuff, and then that, yeah, that was uh, well, it was a reprint of the Jackaroo. First off, uh, the very first American uh, deal was reprinting the the Cyclone material. So yeah, um, uh, yeah that was. Again, the, the 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 big details on that will be um, written about in Daniel Best's book about the origins of Cyclone. Uh, that's uh, we're working on at the moment. That should be out soon. But yeah, um, yeah the the first uh, overseas expression of interest that we got was uh, was we developed through Cyclone. We developed some friendships with some overseas creators that came to Australia for signings, like Mike Grell and Mike Barron, yeah. uh, for two examples. But uh, around that same time as well, uh, we had some cyclone artists, one in particular, Shay Anton Penso, had moved back to the States and uh, he had uh, was trying to sell his wares. So um, he made contact with Malibu, uh, who had uh, the license for Eternity Comics, Adventure Comics and a few other things, Planet of the Apes and whatever. Mm. And, uh, yeah, they cottoned onto the Jackaroo via, via his portfolio showing as well and uh, got in touch so it sort of went from there so that was a, that was um a pretty big deal for um for any of the cyclone guys to, to get a sniff of interest from the states at that time particularly where cyclone was um so that was hard to refuse it was a bit disappointing that, that it didn't take off in the middle of the uh or the early 90s so uh, and there was a black and white boom happening over in the states and mm. so there was a need for a lot of lot of products to take advantage of this uh, upswell in, in interest of black and white independent comics. And uh, uh, I don't know, I think it was probably a product of its time. I don't know whether the Jackaroo would have uh, gone well at any other stage over in the States beyond relatively recently. But uh, the fact of the matter was uh, they were looking for material and uh, they saw the Jackaroo stuff and got in touch and said, hey, and we like your stuff. Would you like to do um, something for us, or could we reprint the Jack Roo material? And I said, Oh well, you know, reprinting sounds great. So that went from there, and then they're looking for other stuff, and they um, got the Southern Squadron with Dave, and it sort of went from there. But uh, you know, in in hindsight and thinking about it, it was uh, you know pretty big deal for an Australian artist who um, had had a desire to get published in the States. The, the dream is always to, to see your stuff in, in the big marketplace of America. So uh, to actually see the, the, the Cyclone logo and the Jackaroo masthead on an American edition of your work is is uh, pretty trippy. So mm. um, although it only lasted three issues, um, uh, the the damage was done. I think I had a, you know, like that little bit of success that I thought, oh, well, this could actually work. if if. Professional editors and publishers over in America think that it's worth repackaging. Uh, I may be onto something beyond an Australian market. So, yeah, um, yeah it was it was um, it was a very very good experience. I, and I'm, it's a shame that it didn't go longer than three issues. But um, you know, there there you go. Maybe next year we can continue on to do a little bit longer than that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you also, um, I mean, you had Astro City there. Now, I noticed. I'm glad Daniel sent in a comment before I come back to it. Um, and uh, he, like, in regards to your writing uh, being excellent, but also another IP that um, you did artwork for that when I found out, 
I didn't know that you'd done this and like like maybe six, seven months ago, I think I sent you a message. Oh, I didn't know you did Planet of the Apes, you know, <laughs> like a story there. Like what how how did Gary come to into the world of Planet of the Apes? Well that that flowed directly on to the lack of success of the Jackaroo. Uh they the guys over there at Malibu still you know, like dealing with me and they liked my style of art. So um, they said, well, if we're not going to do Jackaroo, uh, what would you like to do? And uh, I said, well, what have you got? And they said, well, we've got these licenses, you know, for different movies, um, anything there that's that's of interest. And I was a Planet of the Apes fan. I sort of love the original movies and things like that. So I said, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And so um, it was basically a... a um, you know, a, a table of opportunities that, I, that they said, you know, you can take take your pick. So I said, oh, I'll do a Planet of the Apes uh, miniseries, but, uh, and I'll write, I'd like to write it as well. And uh, I'd like to not have the gorillas and monkeys look like the movies, like men in suits with, you know, I'd like to actually use the comic medium to um, show what it might really be like being, con humans being conquered by real gorillas and, and real orangutans and chimpanzees and things like that so uh they allowed me and obviously the the rights holders warner brothers or whoever had the rights to planet of the apes uh, allowed me to develop a visual look that had uh more of a, a, an animal primate vibe to it than what they would see in the movies so that was a fun project and i was able to work with um dylan naylor on that as the, the inca and greg gates came in uh towards the end to help with the last two issues as well and that was, um, you know, I was looking for, I didn't want to ink it myself because I knew that my inking style was probably a little bit too too pretty or refined. So I wanted someone that I knew was confident with uh, lots of blacks, uh, introduce a thicker line to help uh, create that mood that I wanted. And so I thought of Dylan straight away and uh, he and I just had such a, a fun time on those first couple of issues at least you know getting the, the work done i think that really looks uh, quite a distinctive and uh i still get emails and comments from people out of the blue sort of getting in touch saying oh man i really love that urchax folly that was one of the best things that Mal malibu did and all that kind of stuff so it's nice to know that it, it actually uh resonates uh through the years and people are still commenting about it it's a shame that it will never get collected in, into a trade paperback because of the the rights going sideways and different people mm -hmm. having rights to the Planet of the Apes stuff, but um, you know it was it was a you know a, a good good thing to experiment with, and that was a fun writing project because uh, it allowed me to um, again play in a, a sand pit that I wouldn't usually get to play in. Yeah, yeah, that would be an exciting one if you're a fan as a kid. Suddenly, you know, like yeah. have that. Um, We've got Tom McGee here, and he is uh, writing, I typically wing it right down to the lettering. Any advice or tips for an artist transitioning to doing more writing when making their comics? Oh, yeah, that's a big one. So he, he, if you're an artist and you're starting to write more of your own stuff, uh, yeah, Break the story down first into into what you want uh, told on each page. I think would be uh, the key, and then make sure you have uh, strong layouts that uh, don't that, that allow for word balloons. I think the biggest sin a lot of people still do is that the artist doesn't allow space for the word balloons uh, or enough space for word balloons, and that the word balloons sometimes can be placed badly on the page. So to develop an understanding of um, a, how much wordage to put on a page so you don't get bogged down. You have to be as lean as you possibly can. Leave space for the word balloons. But boy, oh boy, it's so important to put the balloons in the right reading order uh, around the page, you know, top left to bottom right in an individual panel and then across the page as well so that people can follow a page top right to bottom left, top, top left to bottom right, I should say. Um, uh, yeah, so it's really important to understand the um you know the the language of comics and the, and the tricks the simple tricks that it takes and it's it's sometimes can be harder than it looks particularly when you have a, a script heavy uh page but you've got to think of the reader you've got to think of their eyes you've got to think of uh how much time they have concentrating on a panel um and if as a writer if it means that you have to cut something because there's just too much wordage or the story has to expand the page 
Um, you just have to, that's what editors are good for, or at least people who know what they're talking about that can advise you as a new writer when you're, you've written too much. I still consider my writing to be um, far too wordy. I need to cut, 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 cut all the time. So, um, you know, be brave, be as lean as you can. Um, and that means realising the essence of the story, the essence of the scene, the essence of the page, the essence of the panel, trying to get it down to as fine tuning as possible, but also learn the technical aspect of where to put the balloons so that you don't lose the reader. Uh, over the years, I've heard so many people say, oh, I don't like reading comics, it's too hard. It shouldn't be hard at all. It should be our job is to make it as seamless and easy as possible so that the reader, even someone who's not used to reading comics, can fall into the page and we hold their hand and they don't even know that their hand is being held as the story is being told from panel to panel. And if they get brought up, that means you're not doing your job. If there's a question about which one to which word balloon to read next, it means you haven't done your job correctly. So it's a matter of going back to basics and uh, becoming invisible. Um, you know, like uh, you, you're telling stories mostly about, uh, you know, fictional characters you need to bring them to the fore. The story has to come to the fore. The technical aspects of a comic book need to go into the background. They need to be so well learnt and implemented that no one knows that they're experiencing it. That's that's the trick. It's hard, uh, and a lot of people fail. Even you know, in comics, I see today from the the big two publishers, you, I, I wince at some of the balloon placements and some of the uh, the the barriers that a page puts up to a reader. And I can sort of certainly understand if you're not into reading comics um, on a regular basis, how those barriers could really impede your enjoyment of a story. Did you did you get to your level of understanding there through someone like mentoring you through your time, or did you just get there through trial and error, mate, and um, developing your strengths in that regard? Yeah, I think you know, I think pretty much trial and error. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you read the, uh, the technical books. Uh, I was lucky enough to work with Will Eisner on his um, technical books about how to uh, construct pages. And you just deal with, uh, you, like Glenn Lumsden is another expert in the, the field of, of storytelling and structure and, and balloon placement. And, you know, Dave DeVries and Tad, they, they, they all, these are all people that you learn from and absorb as you go. So um, you, you think you're learning it all yourself, but it's really... Uh, you're, you're a sponge and you learn these things the, the hard way. And when, when you see it applied correctly uh, and you know what you're looking for, it's uh, you know, quite a, a sweet thing to know, yeah, that, that page is, is great. And it really looks like a comic page when the word balloons are in place. It doesn't actually look like a comic page until then. And then you put them in place and it's like, yeah, that's right. And now let's read the story. And does it work? Nah, that that one, that balloon there holds up the page. And uh, yes, you, you get to learn it from osmosis. So, and, and and learning from the old masters as well. And you get to a point where um, you know when a page works and you know when it doesn't. And that just takes um, you know experience, I suppose. And and people pointing out to you when it's when it's blatantly wrong, and that's yeah. fine as well. And that's what a good editor uh, should do if you're dealing with um, you know the uh, the big companies or a company that actually has an editor in place. Um, I know that uh, Wolfgang from Gestalt, Wolfgang Bilsma, he uh, tries very hard to, to to edit and correct and adjust because he does a lot of the lettering on the Gestalt projects as well. And uh, he's he's very mindful of that. Uh, he'd probably be one of the the, the best proponents of uh, you know, editing in, in Australia. He certainly, um, certainly knows his stuff as far as balloon placements is, is concerned. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, editors come in very handy. Not so much. I have never had a relationship with an editor that uh, where I've had to wrestle a story to the ground or the editor has disagreed with where I'm going with something. And I've heard of stories where the editor uh, was part of was such a part of the creative process that he was almost, um, you know, should have been billed above the writer and artist of the story. Uh, there have been stories that I've heard in the past from uh, you know, American publishers where the editor was a very strong and dominant personality, and I've never, I've never had that. The editors that I have had dealings with in the past have um, been fairly light as far as the creative touches, but more on a 
you know, production level, they've been uh, facilitating deadlines and production through the to the, to the Inca and to the letterer and colorist and things like that, more so than creatively turning around and going, change it. There was one guy, I did a fill-in issue of um, The Badger for Mike Barron, and that was actually set in Dugga Dugga. The, the Badger was coming to Australia for an illegal racing competition or something. And uh, I had to take all the artwork over to the States, finish. This is before uh, the internet. I was still using FedEx shipping and stuff. But I was going over to the States. I had all the artwork with me. And uh, this guy, I went to San Diego Con, and the editor, I won't say his name, um, looked at the pages and sat down in a cafe in an open forum on the convention floor and started and just like blue lining through all this this artwork going, nah, do that. And there's no way he could have read the story and appreciated what I was trying to do from you know, across 22 pages. But he sat down and he said, oh, no, I need a close up of, a, of an emu's head there. That mid, mid shot's not good enough. And that one there and that one there changed that. So I was there going, where am I going to do? I'm supposed to be at the convention having fun. And now I've got to go back to the hotel room and do all these edits. <laughs> so yeah, that, was, that was the one time that I've had an editor who arbitrarily or not, um, you can still argue whether his decisions were correct. I had to go away and make some uh, fairly severe, you know, artwork uh, alterations for, uh, for before it got accepted. Yeah, oh, how, how does that make you feel? Like, you know, surely at the time you wouldn't have been like you are now and just, oh, yes, you know, like they were rough, but oh, I'll go back and do them. Would have been rather yeah, annoying, I assume. It's just being professional. You just take it on the chin. Um, I mean, I had my opportunity to, um, you know, haggle with him, but mm -hmm. uh, I also, he was a, a senior editor, so you sort of, uh, you know, give him the appropriate amount of, of uh, professional respect and courtesy, and if you can't sway him, with, if he still thinks that, no, 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 it needs to change, okay, I'll go away and change it. So um, that's what I did. Now, it was mm -hmm. a learning process, so. Yeah, yeah, because... Um professionalism and um meeting those deadlines you always hear from um you know like some of the the bigger dudes in america and stuff like yeah um i guess todd mcfarlane everything i see about him he always you know like his is like meet that deadline meet that deadline you know like sort of get into those so it's obviously very important and i'm going to segue off todd's name briefly because it does interest me you were lucky enough to uh have him ink a cover for of your artwork for a comic you did a while back the olympians is mm -hmm. that correct and yep, uh correct. Yep. what what was your experience with uh you know todd if you had any at all because um he would have been a pretty big name back at that point yeah. wouldn't he? when uh you know i had the uh, pleasure of going out to his place with Dave. Uh, Mike Grell was hosting us around that area of Seattle and Vancouver and um, Vancouver Island. So I was lucky enough to to crash at Todd's place for um, a night or so, and uh, he was pretty driven. He was working on, uh, and Dave can probably correct me as far as what he was working on. I think he was just starting his Spider-Man title, his solo title, and he had proven to his editors that uh, he was more important than they were. So, <laughs> so he, he got the title, he had the big eyes, he had the webs going everywhere, and uh, previously he had had many arguments with his Spider-Man editor saying, you're drawing the eyes too big, or there's too much web, it doesn't look like Spider-Man. And Todd's there going, hey, you know, it's selling through the roof. So, so if you tell me to reduce the eyes, I'm going to make one a little bit bigger each issue. And you tell me to stop making all those uh, spider webs going everywhere. I'm going to put more in because the kids love it. So he, <laughs> he knew he was confident in himself and he was confident in the marketplace. And he rolled the dice that if uh, Marvel was to have the editor and Todd hanging from a cliff, chances are they'd save the uh, save Todd more so than the editor. So I think, and Todd knew that that his star was on the rise. And he had a certain amount of um, cachet and and uh, fan power behind him that he could uh, do things the way he wanted. So that that was at the point where um, I met Todd, and so he was very much a uh, a driven person that knew what he wanted. Uh, the run on Spider-Man uh, broke a lot of records, uh, and 
change the way uh, comics were perceived, you know, um, uh, from, from layouts and art style to the, the, what would become the image style. And a lot of people were influenced by the way he approached the page as well. Uh, so, yeah, when, when I knew him around that time, uh, supremely professional, uh, cocky for a reason, because he knew what his skill set was. Uh, I remember him saying to Dave and I, um, in, in context to people coming up to Todd saying, why don't you um, do this kind of title or why don't you do that kind of title? And he was there going, I like, I like doing Spider-Man. I like doing the Hulk. I mean, why would you want to send, uh, you know, a, a, a murdering, bloodthirsty thug? Uh, you'd put him in the front line of your army, wouldn't you? You know, like, there, there's the enemy. Go, go, go and kill. And that's what I'm about. This is what I'm very good at. And uh, I don't want to do other things. You know, my, I know that my skill set is drawing Spider-Man. I know it's drawing the Incredible Hulk and Batman. And uh, he said, why, why would you want to direct me away from, from anything else? And so he was, he was supremely aware of uh, where he was in the industry, I think, at the time. Uh, so, yeah. So it was interesting to talk to him. He, didn't, he, he was still operating on a um, you know, severe, well, however many pages he had to hit per day. And he was, he was a really nice guy. He was, his family was a great host. But he was still drawing all the time and I, I was there. Like, I was on holidays with Dave. We'd just been to San Diego and we're now going, we're in Todd McFarlane's house, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But he was there. He was hardly around because he was behind the draw, drawing board, you know, like, got to get it done, got to get it done. And he was living in Victoria Island, so that he had to FedEx via a plane from Vancouver Island to, you know, Toronto or wherever and then get that down to Marvel. So uh, he was... You know, he, he was hitting those marks. You know, it was hard for him to work from there because he'd moved from from Arizona or somewhere where he was living before. But uh, yeah, he was hitting those marks. And uh, even though he had guests, even though he was uh, you know, had had Grell and and all these other high fluting artists visiting all the time, he was behind the drawing board meeting those deadlines. Yeah, yeah. So how how did we get to? How did you convince him to to ink your cover? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, honestly, I don't remember, but I asked the question uh, either it was through uh, when I came back to Australia through the editor, uh, yep. Marie Evans, I think may have I said, you know, like, hey, I, I, I know Todd, maybe Todd will ink it. Wouldn't it be great? And she said, yeah, that'd be great if we get Todd. So, you know, she, I think she got in touch saying, hey, this guy called Gary who's doing a series called The Olympians wants to know whether you could ink his cover. And Todd, I was still you know, fresh off the bloom from having visited him, he probably was just a nice guy and said, yeah. So yeah. Uh, I think that's what, you know, how that came about. So I do know Still that, pretty uh, cool, man. Still pretty cool, I reckon, you know? Well, like, apparently it was, you know, Dave DeVries can tell you a story about, I think he went back to Todd's place at some stage and he saw the cover on Todd's drawing board and Todd was, there was a, a commitment above and beyond his regular workload inking this cover and uh, Todd was inking it like a foot at a time or a, you know, like a roll of toilet paper or that character there, that head, and it was like being done around the edges of his main Spider-Man gig that he was working on. It eventually got done and it did turn out you know, really well. I was very happy with it. But, uh, yeah, I, 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 it was nice of him to do it, but I think it was uh, probably a bit of a burden based on uh, the workload that he had at the time. But, uh, yes, go Todd. Yeah, yeah. What did that say? So Daniel just said, that was uh, one of the last Marvel jobs that McFarlane did. So that was from Daniel. From after, yeah, then from there he went off to Image and uh, oof, just away, away we go. Yeah, and went into baseballs and toys and all that sort of job, you know. Yeah, yeah, Where did right. things take you? Yeah, yeah. Like, like you, you've been, you've done a fair bit of travelling too in your um time around australia you know like uh you're in new south wales and you've been to western australia because uh you've uh done some stuff over there back to tassie all over the spot like um what did, did you move for different publishing reasons or just changes in life you know like at that time wanted a new scene you know like uh no it was it was more driven from just uh personal choices you know starting up families and things like that 
My um, I, I was born and raised in Sydney, uh, Sydney cider, and um, my first wife, who I met in Sydney, all of her family was based in Perth. So when it was time to settle down, um, you know, she said, uh, "Do you want to go back to Perth?" I'd never been really hadn't seen much of Australia and I thought oh yeah why not so went over to Perth had our family over there stayed there for another 20 years um, you know um, lost one marriage started another uh, moved <laughs> all around WA down in the southwest area saw that and then um, uh, moved to Tassie and I've been here for now for about 14 years now and um, don't think we'll be going anywhere else it's a lovely little part of the uh, the, the country and yeah. uh yeah yeah so it's good nice, so nice the great things, yeah it is well one of the great things about it is after so many years of going around the country and doing comics in different uh formats and versions and having all these different trials and tribulations of living a life as you do um it's turned out that uh, you know glenn lumsden and his partner are, are living in the north of the state so i get to catch up with him on a regular basis again after um, a big gap of time where he was in south australia and working with dave and doing his own thing uh to be able to touch bases with him and we formed quite a uh, you know close uh bond again uh, after a huge gap from the cyclone years to um to uh, us both I, I won't say semi-retired but you know comfortable in tasmania and i, I it's, it's great being able to uh, go up to Glenn's place and see some of the stuff he's working on. He, uh, when, you know, when he finishes a um, a phantom cover for Fru or um, develops or finishes a page of continuity on one of his stories, he'll still send it through for comment. And I'm lucky enough to um, see that while it's in production. And we have some, you know, we, we see each other. He comes down, we go up there to his place. We sort of spend weekends together and things like that. And it's such a... Uh, a uh, nice thing to have happened um, after you know decades of being in the trenches and, and starting out when he was a young guy, uh, a lot, very young when he started doing comics and uh, sort of come back sort of full circle and he, he knows what he's doing. He's having great success with his phantom artwork and uh, the stories that he would like to write as well. And uh, you know, I'm about to enter the same kind of phase as he is of not really wanting to say yes to outside projects anymore just concentrate on doing what you want to do but do it well and uh, that's where he's at and uh, hopefully next year that where that's where i'll be at more as well um once this whole parkinson thing settles down and uh you know we can we can get on with telling some new stories with the jackaroo so it's been a real bonus being able to to catch up with him and um you know, the talks we have is much like much like this you can only imagine that it goes off into the wee small hours uh talking about movies talking about comics and it's the same things that sort of happen all the time you know talking about what we like and don't like it'd be great to actually sort of uh record some of those conversations but uh you know they're like gold but uh yeah they're great you know glenn's a, a very lovely guy very smart knowledgeable and uh boy uh yeah is he is he talented that's uh that's amazing Mm, yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I definitely admire his artwork. I uh, do collect the Phantom. So now, oh, here's here's Spedzy. He's got one for you, mate. So Gary, what do you think about the state of Aussie comics, and what can we do to improve the scene? Good one, Spedzy. Oh, bloody hell! I think it's all heading in the right direction. I think. Um, looking at the state of Aussie comics. I think it's very healthy at the moment. Um, there's different, uh, it's, it's unkind to say different levels, but there's a wide variety of, uh, you know, publishing outlets that people can um, take advantage of now. And if you're driven enough, the opportunities for getting into international publishing is uh, uh, much greater now than it ever was, the opportunities now. Um, comics, I think in Australia, what I've learned in when putting the ledgers together and seeing the, the long list being developed year after year is that it's not just about superheroes anymore. They still have a large part of the pie, um, but there's so many other uh, genres and uh, um, expressions of interest using the comic book language that are coming into, the, into play now. 
and uh, the, the zine fairs that are out there, the, the low key photocopied comics are still relevant. The web comics, the uh, Instagram comics, the uh, the the um, you know the digital printing, the low print runs, but also the the attention that major publishers uh, like Allen and Unwin and um, players like that um, are giving to graphic novels and graphic novelists, even the American publishers like uh, Fanta Graphics and uh, Drawn and Quarterly are uh, paying attention to um, Australian graphic novels and either reprinting them or commissioning brand new material from different creators as well. So I think there's never been a better time to uh, to get your ideas down. Uh, and the hard thing is to realise what you want to do with them. Uh, you know, some people are quite content. They might have the next war and peace in mind, but they're quite happy just posting it on their Instagram page. And that's totally fine. But there's also, if you have the next war and peace, you can also, um, you know, pitch it to an, uh, um, uh, a large real deal publisher and it's in with just as much of a chance as uh, any other project to, to get picked up. I think that's strengthening as the years go by. Um, as far as the Australian comic scene is concerned, you know, I've always thought that the, the biggest strength of the, the, the scene of the industry in this country is its diversity uh, and how the, the support is there, like the, the community, the comics community and the reverie publishing community and even people that are behind the, the gestalt um, graphic novels and the, the higher quality releases from companies like that, Alan and Unwin, as I've said. And then you've got the, the creators that have, you know, that aim to do work locally, but they also aim to pitch their work for the American and overseas market. Um, no, no two projects, that's again from the ledgers, I found that there's no two projects you could really compare side by side, which is why Tim and I decided on the, the way to approach the ledgers was to approach judging a project on its own merits. Because comparing uh, two super Australian superhero comics could be quite unfair, or comparing a superhero comic to a A5 photocopied comic would be unfair as well. But if you could judge a project based on what it set out to do, what the creators tried to achieve as that one-off project. So it's really competing against itself and against the skills of the creator. How successful was the team in bringing that idea to fruition? And that's the way we were trying to sell to the judging panel how to approach this. Because um, the, the Australian comic scene is, is so diverse and it would be kind of you know unfair for it to be a, a competitive thing when uh, we have such a strong history over the last 20 or 30 years of being supportive of new work, being supportive of new creators as much as possible. And I think that's uh, still one of the strengths is the, uh, the, the, the community aspect to it. Uh, ben Sullivan has just said, this is a fantastic conversation. Thank you both. So I'm glad you're enjoying it, Ben. He's a good dude, Ben. Um, mate, do you think, do you think there's, the um, strength and diversity of Australian comics, like, um, I guess for me personally, just I'm just talking as a kid here and stuff, you know, like going backwards in time, there was um, lots of stuff in the newsagents drops and then in that mid-90s, you know, you couldn't really buy a lot of Australian stuff, you know, like from your, you know, newsagents and Mini Mart and that. And then... Um, somewhere along the lines probably 2007 2008 i noticed things for me you know was getting a bit better coming into finding people and that i guess the internet was coming and that do you think in its own strange way with because I, I i spin out and i'm only a baby at this you know that but i spin out how many people creators with voracious appetites and stuff are just coming through and pumping our comic books and do you think in a strange way that as as bad for people and stuff that covid was for um people you know that have a story i guess uh a bit more introverted and stuff you know like like drawing and that do you think covid may have brought that out in some of these creators that may have just let it sit? Yeah, I, I think there was a, um, a, a pulse beat there, an opportunity there that uh, allowed for 
creators to um, have some headspace to uh, try and process not just uh, COVID and how that world-changing event happened and the way we lived our lives in Australia. Um, but if you could compartmentalise that, because, you know, for, for me, I was, COVID was a, uh, a very small part of my um, diagnosis year to year and a half with, with Parkinson's. I would sit down with Belle, my wife, and it'd be sort of like, well, that's that's crappy. I've you know got this and this, and we've got this to worry about and, and work and da-da-da-da. And then we'd pause and go, oh, yeah, and by the way, there's COVID on top of all that. And I'm sure that I wasn't the only one that was having all different kinds of emotional uh, upheavals that was overlaid by the existential upheaval of the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. But what it did allow, excuse my shaky arm, what it did allow for was with people not working as much, they could uh, maybe have time to assess their thoughts. And as you say, have time to put it on paper, whether it's writing it up for someone to draw or sitting down to draw that story uh, that they would never normally have an, uh, that 18 months to two years worth of um, reduced work or no work to actually approach. So it was, um, you know, I, I think there was a lot of opportunities taken. I know on a, uh, a more, you know, grander scale that there were, there were several graphic novels that were probably finished in the COVID period that normally would still be being worked on. So um, I think that was a great opportunity and it, was, it gave a uh, inkling of what life could be like for, for artists and writers if, uh, you know, we didn't have the, the grind of paying the bills so much or the way our society is structured where, you know, the nine to five, Monday to Friday kind of thing sort of gets in the way of, of being creative. And uh, you know, hopefully it, it allows, it allowed for a lot more creators to say, hey, I can do this and I still, yeah, I've got to go back to work, but now I'm invested and I know what it's like to create a page or a project or a zine or a mini comic and I'll still, I'll still do it. That, that opportunity there, that, that was great. And I'll try and now force the issue by making time for myself to uh, get some more stuff done. So I hope that's the case. I hope there are more small time comic fairs and zine fairs around. Uh, I know there's one coming up this weekend in Hobart, the small zine fair, I think in Hobart. Uh, and that's the, these smaller festivals are very well attended. And uh, that, that whole um, grassroots subculture is, is where it's all got to, got to start from. And, uh, you know, it's like the, the music industry where you start getting your first gig in a, in a pub, you know, and start honing your craft. Um, that's what's that's what's got to happen, and I think Australia is is very good for uh, you know starting to do those kind of things more and more. Now, have you found with um, the ledges and stuff that you're getting more entries and stuff over the last couple of years since you've been doing it? Like, would that compare? It's, uh, it's been kind of constant. I have to admit, since um, you know I was doing it for, uh, essentially across a ten year span, and uh, it's slowly creeping up. It's slowly creeping up, but it's always been a uh, you know a problem getting people to um, to not not participate, but to to some some people are bit, some creators are very diligent and want to represent and want to add their work to the long list, but just by definition you can't get everyone, and so there's a whole swag of uh, people who uh, don't tune into the internet communities and and don't know uh, you know the, the the circle of social. Uh, influence that certain things happen so their, their work gets missed and that's always been a, a problem that uh, we want to outreach and all it really might mean for whoever takes the awards on moving into the future whether it's Bruce or someone else um, is to try and th that's a part you need outreach you need some promotion you need people to be aware that uh, you know get onto the long list that, that makes it worthwhile uh, and really the, the Ledger Awards isn't so much about the, the winners, it's more about participating and making sure that your work is acknowledged as a thing. Even that thing just means being listed as a, an annual, uh, you know, a thing that was achieved in 2012 or a thing that was achieved in 2023. Or, you know, it's, it's important to be, to be there amongst the whole mob of other creators to, um, to, be, to be part of the, uh, yeah, the, the, the community. Yeah, that's cool. Because I, I um, now, Brit, your work's also available. I'm going to talk about Owner Indie, um, which is a another Australian online comic book shop. Now, 
your work is through Owner Indie. Yes, that's mm -hmm. available there if anyone watching wants to jump on and get some of Gary's stuff. And, mate, do I recall that? Now, there's some Planet of the Apes artwork available on that, isn't there? Uh, yeah, I think so. I don't know whether the entries are still relevant, but they might very well be. I think I've updated the site enough that, uh, yeah, there's a couple of uh, pages there. And I've still got a stack of artwork here that uh, I'm slowly, you know, letting letting go for sale and things like that. So, um, yeah, yeah. 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 No, that's, that's some, awesome. Some, yeah, some some projects I still have the original art for. It's, it's funny, it's never been the side of... Um, things that I've worried too much about. The, the, the artwork just sort of piles up there and every now and then when the need arises, it's like, oh, maybe you could put something on the market and sell a couple of pieces or a cover or something. But it's never been a driving uh, force for me, so I just let it pile up a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, then, and then Daniel Best comes along and takes it all off my hands. <laughs> I was going to uh, say, uh, he'd really be sitting out there going, a pile of artwork? Where? Pile of you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring an extra bag down there next yeah. time I see you. Uh, I, I have a, um, a fan base of one, a customer base of one, you know. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that'd be awesome, man, to like, have a look at all that because it's like, yeah. So, And that never really phased you, like, just you were more interested in doing your artwork and producing your comic books and getting that, that out there to people. Because I know there's a lot of people that do, you know, like as soon as they've finished the page, you know, like they offload it and things like that. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I, I tend to keep it for a little while. Uh, the whole prospect of, of selling it doesn't really come into my mind um, unless, you know, like months, years later, there's a, a need where I need to raise some money or anything like that. But generally... Uh, on selling the art uh, beyond the print project is not not very high on my um, agenda at all. So um, uh, I know a lot of uh, so a lot some artists have agents that handle um, original art sales and things like that. Takes it off the hands of the artist completely, and they just say, "Yeah, tell me what you sell. You know, send me a check when you sell the twenty pages or whatever." So, uh, but that, that, that I've never done that. So um, yeah, it hasn't been much of an interest. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Oh, here's one from Danny Nolan. Oh, Your Danny. work on the Australia Comic Book Database is one of the most important projects currently running in Oz Comics. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I would. Think uh, that's, yeah, yeah, that's I'll, our I'll next topic, mate. Like, yeah. uh, good on you, Danny, because I also agree with that, mate. So tell us about that one, Gary. Uh, well, that was a, a flow-on um, project from the ledgers that, the, again, the, the long list each year is so important that people contribute their uh, their information to the site so that not only are they eligible for um, the, the awards each year, the Comic Arts Awards of Australia, as they're now called, um, but that also allows me to have a track record of uh, all the creator information. And when you register to become a participant in the Ledger Awards, we ask you to send through a PDF of the issue for the judges to have a look at. That allows me at the same time to have uh, access to a nice cover scan and all of the legal information and the creator information that I can make an entry for the uh, comics database, which is sort of like a sister site to the long list. I'm using the long list as my basis and working through the past years. Uh, and uh, Daniel Best is working through new comics and whatever old comics he can finally, uh, you know, work through in his collection as well. So he's working on old stuff and uh, new material. And I'm slowly working through all the Ledger Awards entries that I still have on my filing system here to get um, at the flesh out the, the 2000s and the 1990s, working backwards using the, the long list as a basis. So it's a, um, a, a double-edged uh, sword. You get the, the long list for yearly awards, and then I use that, that resource to flesh out the, um, the, the database. And then hopefully it'll get to a stage where um, I can make it accessible, where people can upload their own comics themselves with the, their own cover, and then I just have to, and, or, or Daniel and I, edit the entry to make sure it's accurate and keeps it up to date. And it becomes a, um, a resource for... Uh, everyone to, to utilise because, you know, I don't think people really realise how many comics are produced each year and how many comics have been produced over the decades. Uh, the good thing about something like the comics database is you can go into little search 
and you can put in a year and it brings up all the comics that I've uh, made entries of for that year and you can start to see, oh, yeah, Hair But the Hippo was out at the same time as this one was, and you get 1994, for example, and you get all these amazing lists of, oh, it's, it's sweet going down memory lane when, when you're looking at all these titles, you know, Dar and Dill, Hair But the Hippo, uh, um, Zero Assassin, um, Greener Pastures, all lined up next to each other. You know, you can do your different searches and parameters to get different kind of results. Oh, just put in the creator's name and, and put in Dylan Naylor and see all of his comics come up there and it's like, oh man, he's done a bloody lot of work, <laughs> done a lot of work. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's lots of ways to enjoy the site beyond just, um, you know, pure information and, and new titles. But, uh, you know, it's nice to do different search parameters and, and see what the results are. And it's only going to get better. You know, we're, I think last time uh, we updated the site, we're up to about almost 1,600 entries and uh, I've still got probably about five years worth of uh, old ledger entries to add as well as current years and things like that. So there's a, a lot more to go and that's not really being so comprehensive with the pre 1980s entries. Yeah. Uh, that older uh, historical material for Australian comics is covered really well in uh, a couple of other sites like Oz reprints and a few other things like that. We will be dipping into that, but it's uh, not our ma main uh, mandate we want to get those uh, ledger years covered and being able to get new comics moving forward 2022 2023 and uh, each year get that uh, content created uh, of uh, new comics that are being produced so uh, we'll work backwards as best we can but where our main thing is chipping away from year to year with new stuff now that's um i'll just read out that uh website if it pops back up to get through to you um the yeah you know, any obviously given the fact at the moment there it is for anyone that's australian comics db.com.au so next question gary can uh you know obviously we don't want to bombard you at at present you're a busy man and stuff um can people that have produced a comic book that may have only produced 10 or 20 copies of it you know like send um emails to there and so there's no yeah. you don't have to have you know like be scared that you're not up to a print run you know like sales standard no, or anything. There's, just, there's no restrictions and for the database itself you don't really necessarily have to enter it into the comic awards either uh you can go straight to the database site and uh just send us the uh, what we're after basically is um a decent cover scan um or a pdf uh, of the the book itself so we can get a cover scan from the pdf and a, uh, a thorough list of uh creators and anything else that like a a little bit of a blurb about what's in the book um and that way we can make a fairly comprehensive entry and uh leave it at that so uh yeah but but any kind of uh comic really uh as long as it's an australian or has an australian creator involved uh they're the they're parameters we want to be inclusive instead of exclusive and uh, hopefully, once I get <laughs> Jet Illustrated number two finished, um, that's one of the projects I'd like to do is to make it a little bit more, to up upgrade the whole database so it's a little bit more user-friendly uh, where people can claim entries so that you can have people that look after their own family of entries like comics and things like that can come in and um, curate their entries if they want as well. You know? So Danny and I are both, he is uh, you know, co-editor of the site and uh, he's got some ideas for it as well as far as growth and expansion. But, uh, you know, one step at a time, just trying to get all this uh, workload out the way and mm -hmm. uh, trying to streamline the, the whole um, you know, experience of uploading new comics to the site. But it's growing, it's growing really well and I'm really um, happy uh, where it's at. Um, but there's lots of potential for, for growth there for using it as a uh, really interactive and robust um tool uh to have a play around uh comics current and past going backwards yeah 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 there uh it's it's a, it is an important um uh tool mate to be honest with you because um i think when you look at stuff like that like I, i've looked at the site and things you know and um gone through the list of comic books it, it amazes me even too with owner indian stuff to see just how how much volume of um work that is out there by creators, man. And I, I actually find it myself really um, inspiring, man, you know, like to uh, think that 
you know, there's others that have gone before, uh, you know, with me at this point, and there's others that will come into the future, man, you know, and it gives them, um, I don't know, it's, it's a, it, you know, it's a pretty good feeling, mate, to know that there's others out there, you know, like uh, that um, are doing it. And I think um, it's a hugely important thing, man, you know. It's amazing. And it's, um, hard, it's hard to um, corral some creators and their output uh, into a single um, resource. Uh, like some, I'm just trying to think of an example of uh, you know, Scar, uh, Steve Carter and Antoinette Ryder. They yeah. have had such a, um, a huge career uh, and they've worked for so many publishers, their own publishers, but so many dotted projects, a colourful career um, that it's, it's their kind of work that um, I'd love to be able to be fairly comprehensively listed on the site. And um, uh, pe people like that, that don't necessarily like, for me, I've got a fairly linear kind of career, but there are a lot of um, creators out there that have had stops and starts and working for different people and, and little obscure series that, that we'll never know about. And, and, you know, I worked for the Northern Territory newspaper on a, on a comic that was an insert somewhere and, you know, like strange little things that, that that's the kind of stuff that I'd love to be able to corral and uh, um, I've got to upload. <laughs> that's Danny Best. Yeah. <laughs> He's got lots of scar stuff. Good, good. But that's just a, an example of uh, those two creators have had such a an extensive uh, and wide, wide-reaching, expanding career, both in Australia and overseas as well. But that's the kind of stuff that I'd love to cor corral and and be searchable online, so that there's a um, and that the information is correct. Because that's the other thing. Uh, some of this uh, stuff um, has a lot of incorrect information attached, and it's good to have it correct and and definite, and so you can go to one resource and know that the chances of it being correct are um, you know. 90 to 100 percent um hmm. a lot of things get lost in the wash with australian publishing uh and uh, that's what we're trying to, to to capture so that it doesn't get lost yeah it's um it's amazing too what you see um people like bring up on you know the facebook sites and stuff too you know like australian de there's little things like australian pre-decimal comic books and stuff that um uh, Man, I, I look back on and, you know, there's little stories. Pick this, this up at a flea market or pick this mm. up here, there and everywhere, you know, like these little gems that are like just tucked in someone's drawer, you know, like for 30 or 40 years, mate, that um, are just, yep. you know, may have been a thousand printed in the day, but due to time and, you know, things happening, you know, like because um, you know about that, you had a, a flood that happened to uh, one of your comic books back in the day so you know yeah, natural exactly. disasters can happen anything can happen to finish print yeah, yeah. I and mean, i still get people as well just talking about a um the, the history of cyclone um people getting in touch going oh i didn't i never knew that you did you know that and it was like a you know maybe kinetic comics that phil barlow and i co-published under the cyclone banner and uh or or the occasional cyclone special that people who say that they're fans of Cyclone and think they've got a fairly thorough collection of the Cyclone titles, and that's just Cyclone, yeah. um, and then you can still pull up a title that they go, oh, what? <laughs> I, I didn't know that uh, you published that. Never heard of it before. And it's like, come on, you know, Cyclones aren't that hard to, to track down, you would think. But, mm -hmm. you know, there's a hole in someone's you know, mental collection of Australian comics that uh, can easily be filled, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, do you like? Um, do you like? You're a writer. You're an artist. You're a mentor to a lot of Australian creators and stuff like that. You know, I can think of many names. Um, you know, there's Ashley Wood and different. You know, there's mate um, Ryan Vella's one. You know, like me. Um, it's do, what what side of it have you liked the most? the time that you've been doing it man i guess is what i'm asking like what's the the side that really um... uh, I've, I've probably gone through phases of um you know wearing the cyclone hat there for, for many many years and that was a driving force trying to get the the cyclone brand um you know up and running and to have it maintained that was that was my uh you know publisher hat i suppose uh, and i've now grown into uh grown out of maybe that to a certain extent and now i want to concentrate on the creative side again which comes back to the work that i want to do with the jackaroo um yeah. 
and it goes through phases. But you know, there's there was obviously there was a um, you know a period, uh, a, a great chunk of my uh, professional career was uh, trying to maintain Cyclone as a as an imprint, um, more so than individual IPs. I was there trying to keep um, you know the Squadron and Dark Nebula and GI Joe and the Jackaroo to a certain extent as well, all um, you know spinning plates at the same time, and uh, you know I was having great uh, joy in seeing that um, come together and so and then that sort of like informed my uh, decisions when Cyclone Comics Quarterly with Ashley came out and uh, the project with Dark Horse Comics with Dark Horse Down Under and even with Modern Tales when I did a anthology a little section of the Modern Tales commercial web comics site called Short and Curlies that featured a few Australian creators for the American market uh, it all had that cyclone hat on which was different to being a creator it was mm -hmm. like promoting australian creators it was trying to curate curators under one spot you know i tried that a couple of times um so there was that that impetus was there quite strong in me obviously um and that played off of me doing my own stuff as well uh you you'd occasionally get an offer from mike barron to do a badger or Kurt Busiek to do an Astro City, or Kurt again asking me to come on doing that Batman Manhunter thing for Power Company where I got to draw Batman. Uh, and they were like, not interruptions, but they were opportunities that happened <laughs> along a career that was being that was being built. Yeah. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm almost 60 now, and I've learned that uh, saying no sometimes is a, a good thing, to know when you need to focus and stay on target and there's many times in my career where I've gone off target to the detriment of uh, the bigger plan and yep. I think now it's just a case of uh, you know saying no more and and the way is head down bum up keep your knees bent so that you can avoid any kind of trouble as it happens like the old uh, cricketers behind the uh, you know the the batsman waiting for the catch. yeah yeah you know we can keep it get ready yeah stay focused yeah yeah uh, and you know I've had this chat with you as well uh, many times about you know the way but uh, also I haven't mentioned I haven't mentioned the way to to Glenn Lumsden but he and I are on the same page of just stay focused don't worry about all the other crap that happens you know don't worry about all the politics and the you know the the, the backbiting and and that may happen in a community every now and then. Just get the work done, get the work done to the best of your ability. That's what you're waking up wanting to do. You know, if you're into comics as a creator, you want to write stories. You know, or if you're an artist, you want to get a really good story and you want to start drawing it and you want to finish it. And then, oh, oh my God, you may want to even get it published. Well, stay focused and do that. You know, like just stay on target. It's like the Star Wars quote, stay on target. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 but it, it's and, uh, perfect advice, man. To be honest with you, because um, like even in you know my little time here, you know, um, you can start off and then you get all these sparkles thrown out at you, and you're like, yes, I'll do that, I'll do this, I'll be happy to, I'll be happy to, I'll be happy to, and then suddenly you realise like, wow, I'm six months doing, other, yeah, you know, like yeah, other things, and I've lost the you know, like what I started this mission for, you know. And but if you were to say to me, this is don't ever put me on a debating team because I'll be on both sides. But if you were to say to me, would you ever take away the Batman issue that you did for Power Company? I would say no. Would you ever take away the experience of working on Astro, Astro City comic? I'd say no. Would you ever take away the experience of spending, you know, four or five years working with Will Eisner on John Law? No. Uh, but overall, you know, like decades later, those things were um, distractions. They were fantastic distractions, but they were mm -hmm. distractions that how many Jackaroo comics could I have drawn in that time? And how many, uh, you know, we'll leave it at that. How many Jackaroo comics could I have done in that time instead of these little side projects, which were, were wonderful in and of themselves, but they were, they were major successes in my life. There were many not so successful yeses that I said yes to that just ate up time. They just were, I shouldn't have said yes to that, you know, there's mm -hmm. no way. And uh, the more of those uh, less than pleasant experiences you have across your career, the more you realise that uh, saying no is a mighty, mighty thing that uh, sometimes is uh, what you've got to do. But you, 
you know, you live by your decisions and you die by your decisions. And, um, you know, therein is a career. Yeah. Oh, oh Peter Lane just uh, wrote a comment there, mate. Um, and ex he wrote, exactly, forget about the political stuff and focus on comics. And, yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes that can be hard to do. Um, you know, I've had my fair share of, uh, you know, headbutting with people, particularly with the, you know, the Ledger Awards and navigating that water, those waters of the, the nature of awards and um, people feeling that they've been ignored or uh, that the awards didn't come to the right projects or, you know, all of the vagaries of putting something like that together. You know, I've, I've had my kicks to the head and my frustrating, you know, screaming out in the darkness you know, in frustration at certain things that are you know, outcomes that have happened there. Um, but, you know, that's that's all part of it. I don't regret for a second. I still believe this country can have a set of uh, comic book awards that reward excellence because we're doing more and more excellent stuff. And so to shine a light, to have a focus each year on the work that's been done uh, is very important. The long list is very important. I think we're, you know, we, we've got our long trousers on now. We're not in shorts anymore. You know, like we're we're <laughs> strong enough and big enough to be able to take a few, uh, you know, wax on the chin if people don't like what's going on. But I think we're as as a as an industry as a scene, we're we're big enough now and strong enough now to to weather some uh, you know some rough weather and to be able to take. Uh, it'd be great to be able to have a, um, a, you know, a really, not negative critical, but a critical site that is set up or comments made where uh, more attention is given to, um, you know, the language of comics, the, the art of comics, the deconstructing of comics as whether uh, the, the, a given project is, is successful. More along the lines of what the ledgers are set up to do, but more on a forum of a, a book or a magazine or a website that focuses on that kind of stuff so that when a project gets released, the latest issue of Battle for Bustle, you don't just get a promotional blurb about it, you actually get someone who knows what they're talking about um, deconstructing it for its strengths and weaknesses as well and that you as a creator get something from that, mm. that you're not just going, oh, that guy's full of crap or whatever. Um, I, I think we're at that stage where... Um, that could be, you know, may, maybe I'm wrong. You know, what, what do you think? Are we uh, at a maturity stage in this uh, scene here where uh, it would probably go down like a lead balloon, but I still think I still strive for that sort of creative robustness of commentary. I, I would think that there's um, certainly in the people that I have, you know, like stuff to do with and a lot to do with, mate, there's um, um, an admiration for their work. Um, and I also think... Um, there's also having the comfort to improve. I think it, I don't think you necessarily do this stuff to like just do one and done. You know what I mean? Mm. Like you, you sort of want to improve um, yourself, your own skills, whatever they are, your position. You know, like your standing, how you view yourself in the community and stuff. Um, I think that healthy. You know, stuff is good. I mean, you, you, God, you're never going to escape trolls and stuff, are you, on the internet these days? You know what I mean? Well, that's but right. um, That's why the person offering um, the review has to have bona fides and, and it is a credible person that their opinion actually means something. Uh, mm. And I think there's enough of those kind of people uh, percolating around the scene from all different cuts of cloth uh, yep. that would allow for an interesting debate, even if, like, a given review on a site might have um, you know two or three different people having a, an online review conversation about yeah. certain points of an issue uh, so that you know don't just have one reviewer you have a conversation about a, a comic from different points of view that yeah. um, allows for a more comprehensive examination of, of uh, you know what the, the book is about all to the point of getting people to pick the book up because they, they mm -hmm. uh, that is the tool that allows them an entrance way into what they're doing. Yeah, so, I, I would think you're right. I think there's definitely people that, you know, you can have conversations with about that. That would be hugely interesting to me because I know um, when I started this, I, my, I was just head down driven, I'm going to finish Battle for Bustle and I didn't sort of, 
you know, had my own views and my own ideas of what I wanted to do with the comic book and stuff. And since, you know, like um, uh, talking to peers and people I admire, you know, being lucky enough to talk to you and, you know, like asking questions and doing art with other people, I've found a desire in myself um, to improve, uh, you know, like my artwork and writing as best as I can, you know. Um, and that, that for me, the importance of that for me has come from having conversations with people like yourself and others that have read, you know, Battle for Bustle and have, you know, like met me and talked and seen how I draw and just, you know, maybe think this, maybe think that, you know, like it's, but it, you know, like I, 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 mate, I myself personally have no issues with anyone who wants to have dialogue with me in that regard because... Um, well, and, and I think that that's the approach is important and has to be an overarching positiveness about it, that we're not doing this to rip shreds off anything. It's going to be, and, and if it's a positive review, it's a positive review, but uh, it's got to be couched in a um, positive framework that no one's getting uh, there's no intentional damage being done this is all mm. constructive and uh, i just thought then of um the comic arts workshop that uh that has been held a couple of years in a row and i think there's another one on soon where a whole bunch of people that have ideas uh or graphic novels or projects to work on take what they've got that's unfinished and all their notes and they go off for a, a week and each of them have their moment in the sun to to pitch their work to these other creators in the room and the whole thing gets pulled apart and put back together again and that workshopping of ideas uh is so invaluable like a, a raft of uh, uh award winners from recent ledger awards have been through that uh, workshopping process um and come out the other end with publishing deals and um and they've been through that mentoring uh process where it's not mentoring necessarily from above by someone who is more expert or more senior it's mm. from the side from people who are going through the same creative process as well so yep. um, I know that negative reviews or constructive criticism can be damaging and that's what you have to be very mindful of mm. that that mm. kind of review has to be couched in a positive in a positive way and the uh, the comic arts workshop does a lot of good in in uh, getting to that stage before the work gets published it's actually workshopped and um, any problems, creative problems, talked about with a, a friendly, uh, supportive environment before the work gets finished. So mm. I think that's uh, that's pretty important. But to have that um, expanded and reflected in a right, you've got the latest issue of you know Spudman come out from from Gestalt. Um, you know, let's pull that thing apart and um, you know see where it goes from there. From a couple of people that uh, are, are approaching the the reading experience from different points of view. Mm -hmm. well that that's um i think that's healthy and i mean there's all elements too like from from talking to you tonight and like talking to other guests and meeting people there's so many different levels of it too and everyone's important whether you're like uh, as you said like your editors are very important not just you know like i guess the artist you know like is like the lead guitarist isn't it you know what i mean in the comic book and the writer's like the singer but well, every, yeah, what's the saying you, you come in for the art and you stay for the story yeah and you know <laughs> every but there's so much that goes on behind the scenes mate you know and um from uh reviewers to you know colorist to even the fans and stuff like that people that buy your comic books and all that and um i i, I think um involving people from all of those different areas into you know like a nucleus i guess is a healthy thing man like i think that um creates a community to live you know and um thrive myself and um essentially you know like that's what you want to do you want to improve because as you just said earlier you know you want your last work to be the best but um you know right there you know that's your best but you, you're gearing up to get on to the next one with the lessons that you've learned from getting that last work out you know and always trying to take a you know foot forward um and i think this that's is coming from positive a, this is coming from a beginning point of you assume that most people who put pen to paper and go down to the photocopier and do their little a4 photocopies and fold it in half and staple it and then go to the zine fair they may be the most shy and retiring creator ever and have no prospect or or dreams of being published by a major publisher or anything like that 
but they go to that zing fair and they sit behind that table and they talk about their creative work. Uh, that, that's what it's all about. If not, they would stay home and not do it. So that starting point is you've got a creator that has something to say and wants to interact with the general public in some way. So whether it's a small press zine fair or whether it's pitching to a publisher so that their work gets to a larger market or they put it online as an Instagram comic, it all means it's an it's a, it's a extrovert statement. It's a step towards the public. It's a, it's a step towards having a conversation with your readership. So even if the creator doesn't talk to the person, the comic talks to the person as well. And so mm -hmm. there's a, a positive outward motion of getting that stuff done. And that's the starting point of, of everything. So yeah. when you talk about doing reviews and doing constructive reviews, um, I wouldn't want it to be to, to be damaging at all. But there is also the understanding that uh, if you put it out there, the audience has to have a thought about it and you need to be able to take that on board somehow or be able to be resilient enough to say uh, uh to take not not criticism constructive criticism let's say uh and then build on it from there mm, mm, mm. i think that's fair i think i think we're in a position where you know like there's a lot of people out there that can do that mate so again you know i, I might like man i'm all about you know building the community as best as it can and strong because like i i love comic books man so it's like uh um you know whatever works for people everyone's different but like oh that's right and people can find their own level uh i think the the community in australia at the moment is such where you can you can float at whatever level you feel comfortable with and if you want to go into deeper water you can uh yeah. if you, you if your uh, willpower is there your skill set is there you feel strong enough so there's little there's markers all along the different levels of professionalism in Australian comics, and you can find your own comfort level. And if you want to sit at that one level for for years and years and years and not move from there, you can do that as well. Yeah, that yeah, that's it's a it's a lovely thing, really. You know, to have that you know thought process of having that comfort because um, you're right, you can go all the way to the top, or you can just be chilling out, man, and happy in your you know your creativity and whatever your sense of bliss is for the whole you know like purpose because um yeah. would you think would you think after all of your time in the industry it's not how, how do you think that your like your own drive to like keep creating and putting stories out is um not just a personal drive and probably not just a dream that you've had since a kid but do you think it it, it takes a particular individual from what i've seen it's it's almost like a, a compulsion you know like this i've got to do it you know like i've you know i've i've got a day off i'm going to draw or i'm going to sit down tonight after 10 hours of work and i'm going to put two or three hours into it you know like it's um there wouldn't be too many people out there that are just like touched by the golden wand you know what i mean that would just get yeah and, and it's and it's hard um, it might not be hard if you're just, you know, doodling something fairly light, but when you start to go commercial, um, it, it's, it's a hard job sitting down doing, you know, eight pages, 12 pages, 24 pages on a semi-regular basis, or even as, as often as you can. It's hard to get into the zone. It's hard to, to do a page that you're happy with. Uh, the different stages of production on a commercial comic is uh, so variable that uh, you know it's hard getting a story together. It's hard doing the artwork. If you're just an inker, it's hard inking a page that you're happy with. Um, you know, then there's the, the whole publishing pre-press and and delivery of the whole thing. It is hard, um, and but it does get you. It, it's uh, it's the kind of thing where it's occurred to me several times during my diagnosis period where you know i as i mentioned to you earlier i thought about packing it in that that's not an option that i can't continue uh what what's not what's the point but uh you know if i can't produce at the level that i need to produce that to be happy uh i should maybe consider walking away and just becoming a writer uh instead of a writer artist um but then I also thought, uh, what am I going to do? You know, like, uh, I can't just walk away from that. I think I'll always be an artist, even if it doesn't get released, I'll still sit down and there's nothing 
that brings me more joy than uh, sitting underneath the studio lamp when everyone else has gone to bed and you know you've got your headphones on and a bit of music and you're drawing away and it's actually working. You're actually in the zone and that hand that you're drawing is actually oh, that's, not, that's not a bad hand for once. You know, and that that horse that you're trying to draw is not a stupid bloody horse, but hey, it looks like a horse. And you know, like the inking that you're trying to, you know, you're doing something metallic and it's actually working out. That zone, that small little golden moment where you're doing comics and you're by yourself because it is a very solitary and uh you know uh egotistical kind of thing to do because you really you're the main customer for a lot of what you do you know, mm. you're doing the story that you want to tell uh and you want to be the person that picks that comic up and buy it you know, yes i'd love the next issue of the jackaroo oh thank you very much you know you know i know exactly what you want young man <laughs> you know so you know <laughs> gary challoner is the main customer for the jackaroo because yeah. hey i know exactly what i want so but you know and to to be sitting on your drawing board and just working on a on a page on a panel on a cartoon um if you're in the zone as an artist or if you're a writer and you're writing the page and it's flowing it's starting to flow it's just flowing that's that's it it's like a drug you want to keep on having that 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 zone moment of being in the zone yeah 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 you're yeah, like I, I assume that your drawing over your time would have been like your meditation, mate, you know, like in uh, all times of your life, you know, like you've always, you know, like, um, oh, what's, Pete, okay, here's, here's a mate of mine actually got one for you, Peter Gascoigne. What do you listen to when you're drawing? <sighs> um I have been delving into a bit of a true crime podcasts lately, but as far as music, um, uh, a wide variety of stuff, you know, from, uh, uh, I'm into the, the the classic rock and roll, I suppose, you know, Bruce Springsteen and The Who and, uh, you know, that kind of era. Um, uh, Kate Bush, original Kate Bush, because she, before she became famous. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, three times. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, so, yeah, a wide variety of stuff um uh but you know doing the, the the podcast thing lately is always good when i'm writing uh it's just i, I don't mind working in silence uh, as well to a uh, uh, to a large degree and i find myself uh, just going through phases of having the studio um when no one else is around you know very loud music pouring through the house as i'm working away or um you know writing quietly or drawing quietly um like at the moment now so there's some family members that have gone to sleep because i've got to get up early so it'll be a quiet night tonight if i was to draw or anything um but yeah it, it um it depends but generally um you know squeeze uk squeeze um australian crawl i love uh springsteen um the who uh that that, that kind of stuff so uh you know fairly fairly standard but uh, not doing that then i'm uh, listening to to podcasts and uh, Lee Chalker on uh, Chin Chin Wag. Uh, <laughs> seven seven shows. Yeah, <laughs> we thought, that's we like almost before we went live about uh, you haven't been cancelled yet. What's, what's <laughs> you're a lucky man. You're a lucky. Man. Uh, oh well, you know they're probably saving it up for you being on here and like next week and next week now, nah, mate. I'll get a phone yeah. call. You know, like, oh, you know, like hey, yeah, I'm, I'm a thread killer, man. You'll get cancelled after this. You know, <laughs> the whole station down. No, oh, mate. You know what? For me, if that was the way, it, if that was the way it was going to go. I, I'm a happy man, mate. You know, like it's uh, it's like I got me mate here. I've like I've been lucky, man. It's uh, that's the other thing, you know, like luck. Sometimes, man, you get lucky. Different perceptions of levels of luck and stuff. So, you know, I'm I've got nothing to complain about, man. It's um, it's lovely, um, enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, having fun. Um, but I um. I was, my mate Pete, who just sent that question in about the what are you listening to? He's a voracious music um, listener, man. Like the man listens like nonstop. I don't. I sometimes would think that he probably even listens to music while he's asleep, mate. There'd be you know like something going in the background. But he's a big Bruce Springsteen fan himself, mate. So and I know that's um, one of your uh, 
you know, like very big ones. There you go, Peter Gaskell, excellent, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. He, uh, we've had, what do we got here, comics. Oh, yeah, this is our Shane. This has been awesome. We want to sign you on for five more seasons. <laughs> Only as uh, Gary, you're coming on those five seasons, mate. So oh, you know, like you're old. not out of it that quick, man. So yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I I'll, I'll come back on um, after the the cyclone book is released, and we can have another chat about that because um, that's another um, you know big thing that's looming in the future is um, finally putting that together because it's the first part of um, a much larger project that Daniel Best is planning. Uh, he was on. Uh, was it last week? Uh, yeah. With, yep. 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 And uh, uh, he and I have had many long chats about um, the need of getting this stuff uh, down on, on paper. It's, it's sort of like it was a, a flow on from the database, really, that uh, he has always had an interest in getting the history of Australian comics on paper, but it was a too big a project. It was, it was a problem on how, how do you approach such a, a varied resource or history or uh, spotted history of uh, Australian comics, even if you were to close the window to, um, you know, post panel by panel by John Ryan, that book that ends in about 79, um, it would be so difficult to try and get a single volume happening. So the logical answer to that was to break it up into a series of, of quite comprehensive um, history books. Um, but the angle of it being to talk to the creators involved, which is what Daniel is good at. He's good at research and he's good at talking to people. So I was lucky enough to, he had a lot of content um, together that was cyclone based. So we kind of decided that maybe that was the first one to, to get knocked into shape. He's got other books that he's finished re, uh, writing that will form a part of the series but he wants it to flow out in a certain way so that there are book two and book three that, that comes after Cyclone that starts to build a quite a comprehensive jigsaw puzzle that builds upwards, you know, front and backwards time-wise to create a, um, uh, hopefully, a, um, a comprehensive uh, picture of, um, you know, Australian comics right around the country and the, the different people and personalities involved because... Uh, that's that's the the other side of the the coin is that you've got your um, your, your hair butts and your zero assassins and your your tal guards and your uh, all these characters, but there are characters on the other side of the coin and they're the creators that are involved and those stories and how those characters got on the page are, are, are just as interesting and and that's the angle that Daniel uh, I think is taking with these these uh, you know history books. And uh, I, I hope more power to him that he can get um, a whole swag, you know, volume seven, volume eight, volume nine, you know, to get to the, the, the comics, history of comics and talk to the players involved uh, and Reverie and, and um, you know, Fantastique and the Melbourne scene and the Perth scene and Brisbane. And it, it's, all, it's all there to be talked about. And it's less about the characters more so than the characters behind the characters. Because uh, Australian comics has a lot of uh, amazing people involved and a lot of amazing stories, as uh, you know, you know from the the uh, Len Lawson story that Daniel put together in that volume called Monster. You know that history um, through to the different murder mysteries that have involved and and different kinds of crime cases, right through to the the uh, the opinions and uh, political fighting of publishing companies like phosphorescent comics and cyclone and why certain things were wound down and started up again and where players kind of went and how they m moved around the scene over the years it's quite a um you know it'd, it'd make for uh, very interesting reading so uh, hopefully the first one will set the the uh the scene for, for other volumes down the track yeah yeah i mate, i um, said to daniel last week i'd, I'd can definitely there's been a few comments pop up there from decent uh different people telling us um that they're really looking forward to that cyclone book and um uh, yeah i think you've got a lot of people's attention there because uh you know like the other thing is too man you know like the history of australian comics is like deep um you know and it, it goes for a lot longer than what a lot of people realize too you know we had daniel on last week talking about that and stuff and um one of the topics that we even spoke about, like Dan, and I thought this was interesting, and I'd love to get your perspective on this if that's cool with you. Um, 
the topic of um, different, I mean, I guess different people have a different I, idea of what a comic book is. So Daniel and I got onto the topic last week and he gave his answer, you know, like what he thought they were. And I would present you with the same question, mate. Like, what do you think a comic book, you know, like is? <laughs> well, in my experience with um, dealing with the judging panels of the ledgers, this question comes up a lot as to what is a what is a comic book, uh, what is a illustrated children's book, picture book, um, and there was no firm answer. The conclusion that Tim and I decided on was uh, let the judges decide themselves as part of the judging process as to whether it should even be in running for being the thing that it is. Um, for, for me, the, the technical response is a, a series of sequential panels telling a story. Uh, it's a cartoon if it's one panel, uh, yeah. and it's a comic book if it's a, or a comic strip or comic book if it's a series of panels telling a story. So time passes between the panels or the arrangement of images. Uh, that's the a technical version. Um, but uh, yeah, you're right. Opinion will vary from person to person as to what the first comic book was, um, uh, what a graphic novel is, whether reprint collections of floppies in a, a spined book means it's a graphic novel or is it just a trade paperback. That that argument will go on till the cows come home. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think what is worth mentioning that uh, you know, I've always wanted to say in a public forum that one of the most important contributions I think that the artwork, has, uh, that the comic art form has given the world and it's not necessarily used all the time in comics, but it's still the most important contribution, I think, is the, the word balloon. Uh, how many, what, what, what that represents is um, sound. And I think it's pretty miraculous to have an oval with a little pointy bit coming out of it. And everyone in the world knows what that represents. That represents a, a voice that someone is talking. The reader does the rest of the work. The reader will give accent. The reader will give uh, speed of delivery, um, but the word balloon itself, and then by extension, the thought bubble. Uh, but the word balloon itself, I think, is one of the most important um, symbols or contributions that the comic book language has given to to um, communication in the world. How many logos or how many usages of the word balloon can you see that have nothing to do with comics, but as soon as you see that symbol with the little pointer, you know exactly what it represents, and that is yeah. sound. And how hard is it to communicate sound on a piece of newsprint or a piece of artboard? But I think that's amazing. You know, like that, it's the miracle of what the language of comics is all about. That a, that symbol, the little oval with a stick coming off it pointing to a mouth, represents sound. And then that allows the reader to do all the rest of the work. And I reckon that's amazing. Yeah. It's. Did you find that when you were growing up and, you know, like, when you were reading comic books as a kid and stuff, you'd have different voices for different characters that you'd made up, you know, like in your internal dialogue as you were reading, you know, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. did you ever feel a little bit disappointed when you saw the movies? Oh, it's not how I imagined it sounded like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I sort of corrupted my boy as I was growing up. Like bedtime stories would be with Tintin and uh, I would use different voices for, uh, different Tintin characters and even a dog and and Tintin, yeah, yeah I decided to, <laughs> to, to mix it up a little bit. So, so my voices were not the way they should be. So you know, when my boy eventually saw that the, the the cartoons and the animated movies and stuff like that, he was not pleased with me at all. You know, like he was really <laughs> to have you know like a, a rough deep voice. And Haddock was um, come on Tintin, let's go over this way. Thousand whispering barnacles, and so I presented Tintin all upside down to to my boy, and uh, yeah, so uh, you can have some fun with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can. Yeah, it's uh, yes. My my dad used to do like read comics to me when I was young, and he'd do the different voices as well. So uh, I have some unusual <laughs> remembrances well, of voices. As well. The thing about um, reading, uh, you know, Batman comics or Superman comics to uh, your boy as well, or girl, uh, your child, uh, is that you don't have an American accent. So, mm -hmm. you know, they get to see a, a Batman cartoon or a movie and stuff like that, and it's already wrong. 
because so no 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 <laughs> Batman's supposed to have a Sydney Siders accent. <laughs> What's going on here? Or you know, from Manjimup in Perth. What's going on? Superman from Manjimup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, mate, uh, uh, you know, someone from Towns will do on Batman. I'll tell you yeah. what, that'd be interesting, yeah. you know. Yeah, 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 I, I, yeah. I, I am the knight. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm going to so try that when I'm down here by myself in the next couple of days drawing and that. I'm going to try and bust out my best Batman voice, you know. What, yeah. what are you? Yeah. <laughs> Towns uh, Batman? <laughs> yeah, I'm the Batman, mate. You know, here you go. Oh, man. No, no, yeah, you put, know, it's sad. Put the bag of money down, you <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, where the bloody hell are the bat car keys, man? You know, like that sort of stuff. Yeah. You know, like I always wonder about that with superheroes and things. Hey, eh? they're Robin, probably yes, Drongo. Get in the car. We got to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You call me Drongo so much. It's like um, <laughs> change his name to Drongo. But uh, actually, that'd be a funny bootleg comic book if that was ever the case. I tell you, you know, like a Ryan Della's making notes already. <laughs> I wonder if he is madly squiggling things there. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to Ryan too. Um, it's uh, man, what what um, what do you reckon's like? I guess amongst all the other advices that you've given tonight to the people that have been listening and stuff, and it may mean. You know, you may go back, you may have to repeat something, uh, depending on what your answer is. What's the one piece of advice that you can give to anyone of any level, starting out, intermediate, on their way up, that you would pass on to uh, any creative out there wanting to get into um, comics? Mm, just the one. Yeah. Well, oh, you know, you can, hey, Gary, you can tell us 500, man. I'm happy to sit here and listen, mate. It's like... Well, no, it, 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 I think I'll go back mate. to the, the, um, the, the step towards um, pushing your idea out into the world. So it's a, it's a case of, you know, the old just do it uh, is don't be scared about putting your idea on paper. Uh, don't be scared about drawing or writing a first draft. Uh, just do it. And uh, don't be scared about asking for feedback, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a trusted uh, friend or a trusted colleague or schoolmate or teacher, uh, if you're a young person still at school. Um, and also to know that there are resources out there and organisations out there and people out there that will uh, help you and answer questions that you may have about certain things, that it's uh, not a closed shop anymore. I mean, if it was 1975 in Australia, It'd be a hell of a lot harder to get anywhere than it would be in uh, you know 2022. So uh, you, you're not alone. You're as you're as alone as you want to be. Mm. And so if you, uh, I think just yeah, just just do it. Take the first step. And if you have questions, don't be scared to to ask of people, whether it's a teacher or an organisation uh, like Comics or, or publishers. Well, I don't think there's any publishers out there that wouldn't. Uh, in a very supportive and friendly way, get back to anyone who has questions about entering the industry or what to do with a certain project, um, you know, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram, just you know, get in touch, drop a line, and uh, you'll get pointed in the right direction. I think there's lots of uh, very friendly and supportive people around here that will uh, do what they can to help out. Yeah, I, um, I think that's good advice. Just um, it's sort of... That rings true with, um, you know, talking to different people over the time is the first step is just to do it and reach out and communicate. And with with means like, you know, Comex and other organisations, as you've said, and publishers and that around Australia, it's like we don't, we're not, I guess, writing letters anymore and hoping, you know, waiting six weeks or seven weeks for a reply and stuff, you know, like there are formats that are available, podcasts, live streams, you can reach out, emails, Facebooks, you know, all of those things. And um, and there's also a lot of, uh, I know it's, uh, you know, over 18s because it's pubs and stuff like that, but uh, there are lots of uh, drink and draws or monthly um, creator catch-ups at different uh, cities, uh, you know, Melbourne, 
and uh, Brisbane and Sydney, I know Perth, I think, also has a pretty strong community where they have regular get togethers that, uh, again, take your stuff along. And, uh, you know, if if you're brave enough to show it, uh, you know, you've you got to show it at some stage because at some stage you wanted to get that stuff out. You have it in your mind. Just get some advice from people who are um, um, there as well. You know, take some photocopies along in the portfolio and, you um, you know, you, you definitely won't be probably have the experience that I had of having my work critiqued on a uh, convention floor by an editor in the, in the middle of the day while everyone was standing around gawking. Uh, you'll be in a much more, uh, you know, comfortable and, and, <laughs> and safer and less traumatic environment. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of which, you've seen your hoard or your artwork. You got any of those original ones tucked away from when you're a young fella, you know, like first starting out? Yeah, yeah, I still got that. In fact, uh, there was a whole swag of uh, Flash Domingo history that I'd completely forgotten about. That uh, I it was a community newspaper that I did a free comic strip for. That uh, oh my god, how do I condense this into something that was that's anyway? Funny story. Sydney, nineteen seventies, late seventies. There was a character called Jeff Little, the smiling policeman. Now he was a a, a traffic cop that uh, had a big goofy smile and he was chatting up the ladies as, as the traffic was going by and they were crossing the road and he had an article or two written about him in the newspapers and he thought this was great. He thought, hey, Jeff Little, the smiling policeman, and I've got, you know, a couple of articles in a row. So he thought that he was a minor celebrity. So for some reason he stumbled onto uh, me in my early cartooning days and he came in, uh, this is after, after his uh, shift duty one day and he still had his police uniform on and he was getting the the, the John Wayne walk happening as a, as a <laughs> thing comes in the game, you know it's my, to my studio and I'm only a young guy I'm like 16 or so at the time and he says um you know how'd you like to you know develop a Jeff Little the smiling policeman comic strip and you know I was there going yeah sure that'd be great you know and you can base it on me and we can have a couple of little school age friends that we get into all kinds of adventures with and uh, I invented uh, instead of having a dog, I thought, wouldn't it be great to have a, a pet platypus that the kids drag around with them? And the platypus would think all these strange things that the, the the kids are getting into all kinds of adventures and the platypus is there going, oh, my God, you know, well, what are we getting involved with now? And this platypus character was called um, Sniffer, Sniffer the platypus. And so that was the very, very early version of uh, Flash Domingo uh, from, yeah. uh, hey, how many platypus characters can one person think up? So, uh, yeah, Jeff Little, a smiling policeman. And everyone, uh, I heard from everyone in the, the police central that he worked with, that everyone hated his guts. He was a typical prat. But, you know, like he walked in with his, you know, oh, he'd spill a newspaper onto the, the sergeant's desk and go, oh, oh, I spilled a newspaper. Oh, look, there's an article about me there. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, when, this uh, newspaper strip lasted for, you know, I don't know, 12, 18 weeks or something like that. And uh, he'd come in and, and uh, it'd be published in this uh, city, free city newspaper. And he'd come in and grab a handful each time it came off the presses. And you can just imagine him going through the, you know, police headquarters, uh, dropping off copies, going, oh, latest copy of Jeff Little's Flying Policeman and my adventures here. Have you, you know, would you like me to sign a copy? No. <laughs> Oh my God! So, so to answer your question, I still have that. I still have the original clippings of the uh, Jeff Little, uh, yeah, comic strip, uh, which hopefully wow. no one will ever see. But uh, who knows? Yeah, I, I don't know. Probably, I reckon that'd be pretty cool. He went into some branding and some merchandising where he had a badge and a t-shirts and stuff. Uh, he loved posing with, uh, you know, the busty ladies with the wet t-shirts on and stuff like that. And uh, one of his sayings was, uh, a smile is a curve that can set a lot of crooked things straight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> now, I, don't know, I don't know whether he's uh, still alive or not, because that was um, a while ago. I certainly don't want an angry retired cop on my case. But no, no, he was, he was a bit of work. But that's one of the very first, um, you know, Things that I got was this uh, little community newspaper thing, and uh, Sniffer the the track. No, that's right, Sniffer the tracker platypus, and uh, yeah, it, it passed comment on all the. Um, it was my voice in the comic strip actually, because I kept on calling you know Jeff Little an idiot, and where are you going now? You and it was me being able to actually 
translate my real feelings about the situation in the comic. And he was going, now, is it a bit rough that Snipper's calling me a dickhead? No, 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 totally in character. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. (laughs) Oh, that's an awesome story. Man, that the whole idea of that dude cruising around with that quote to that shirt, man, is like... (laughs) Uh, oh, you know, they can set a lot of crooked things straight. Oh, you can only shut, you know, the pride beaming out of that dude as he would have been cruising and strutting around the streets, mate, you know, like looking at that, you know. Like, oh, there would have been a cure for like, him that would love to have, uh, you know, yeah, dealt with him in a certain manner, uh, quite, quite roughly, very, very roughly. Yes, he didn't have many friends. Mm. Anyway, the life oh, well, of Well, hey, gotcha. It got you one of your most famous characters uh, started, mate, you know, like yeah, a gestating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Sniffer, the tracker platypus, had a um, spiked collar on as well, yeah. So into the old uh, B&D. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was, that was my uh, next job, yeah, as a, as a freelance uh, graphic designer and cartoonist. Was uh, I was working for a studio in uh, George Street in, Sid- in the city, and uh, the boss came in one day, and I was again, you know, 16, 17 years old, just starting out. And he came in with this, uh, you know, gorgeous looking lady. And uh, she was uh, Mistress Tony, and was just introduced as Tony. But her business was a house of dominance in Redford, and, uh, which is um, an area of town where a lot of uh, terraces had those kind of organizations and businesses run. So, um, and she was interested in having a comic strip done about her. So, um, uh, yeah, we can't go into too much detail, but uh, <laughs> yeah, this, this, this young boy was uh, sent up to uh, Redfin to uh, do research about <laughs> Tony and her and her goings on, and uh, yeah, that was uh, that was my second professional job. Yeah, uh, yes. Anyway, good times. <laughs> good times. Yeah, yeah. Very, very educational. It was very educational. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, the second the second story was probably more educational than the first, mate. You know, like uh, what's the old line from Kiss? You taught me things I never learnt in school. You know, like from that yeah. song they had. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll try and keep it clean, but in the terrace, you open up the front door of the House of Dominance. That you don't. There's no signage anywhere, but just you open up. There's the staircase going up to the top floor. So there's a a space underneath the stair that had um, um, a cage set up underneath it. And my first visit there, I walked down the central corridor to go to the kitchen out the back, the office out the back, and I walked past this cage underneath the stairs near the front door. And there's a bloke sitting there on the floor. And I just nonchalantly went, you know, g'day. And Tony whipped around and, and said, don't talk to him. He's paying good bloody money to be ignored. <laughs> Yeah, ah. that's the honest truth. That's yeah, and and that was the that was the, the a good story. There were some nasty ones as well, but uh, oh yeah. man, <laughs> that, I mean, that'd like be a good t shirt. <laughs> oh yeah. man, <laughs> so like you, you're 16, and these are your, these are your first couple of you know, like professional jobs, man. Yeah, it's yep, like yep. wow. Yeah. It's like I think I think I got to write a book about my uh, my late teens and some of the. Uh, oh, I'm su- I'm surprised I survived to be totally honest. There's some stupid things I got up to, but uh, yeah, that was one of the more uh, safe ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow, man. S- Sydney in the late seventies and eighties was a uh, very crazy place to be. Let me tell you, it was mm. particularly up around the cross and all those kind of areas. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, and, uh, and my mum used to be a, uh, um, when she was alive, she's passed now, but she was a manageress in the liquor industry. And uh, she was given the, the tough job of looking after Ox- Oxford Street in uh, going down to Paddington and Darlinghurst. There was a bottle shop there that um, she was the manageress of and she'd get all the drunks, she'd get all the drug addicts, she'd get all the drag queens, all the prostitutes all coming through there. And she had a reputation for being a bit of a, a, a toughie, but they all they all loved her. And uh, when it came to when the gay Mardi Gras started, uh, it was a case of, you know, Gary, the shop shuts at eight o'clock. I want to be on the train and out of Oxford Street by five past eight because when that gay Mardi Gras hits, 
you won't be able to get me out of here at all because they would have picked her up and she'd be on the main front floats. <laughs> so when it was Mardi Gras night, I'd have to get in there and help her get up and out, count the till, you know, shut the doors, you know, da 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 da, get the alarm on, and just uh, get out of Oxford Street real fast because uh, here comes the gay Mardi Gras. So yeah, fun yeah. time. I'm starting to see some parallels here talking to you of um, how uh, dimensional the, the jackaroo uh, is, mate. Um, and uh, and she said... Yeah, it all informs the work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, work. yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's awesome, man. Like, I, I, I love hearing stories like that because, you know, for me, these characters come from somewhere. You know what I mean? And uh, like yeah. to hear those stories, you can I can see how as well you had like two characters like gurgling away there in the back of your mind mate you know like while going through all this sort of stuff you know yeah it's, yeah, um, yeah. So, uh yeah it all gets turned into fodder really uh you sort of think is the is the jackaroo gary challoner and you have to say no it's not but uh he kind of is you know in, in in a lot of ways you know like in the world that he inhabits and the kind of adventures and people that he meets it may not be him he may be an idealized fictional character uh but there's so many other elements to the stories that uh yeah that that just comes from from me in the life that i've led i suppose yeah yeah well it all adds to the flavors mate you know like mm -hmm. uh of um <clears throat> like what you were saying him being your uh <clears throat> like baby i guess you know and like and even since you haven't done him for a while, you know, you're obviously like percolating there to chew at the bit to, you know, like get back in him. So, you know, like there's lots of lots of stories to tell that uh, would it be extremely interesting. Uh, I'm excited, man. Like I like I like that. I do. I like. Um, I'm excited that you've got so much drive, man. I find it quite infectious when I yarn to you and stuff because you know, like. Um, you've told me that uh information that you spoke about earlier in the show before and um and uh you know every time i've spoken to you, you've always been um much like this mate you know like really positive well driven um just trying to do the best you can and adjust to things mate because um certainly um wouldn't be easy but um um i just want to yeah pass on um mate much respect and honor for you man um and thank you, uh thank, thanks for the opportunity to sort of um you know talk through a few of these things uh today uh it was uh, pretty important uh, for me and I, I think it's helped a lot and uh hopefully it's cleared up a few things for people out there that maybe uh, have, a, have a few questions about the whole uh adventure illustrated situation and plans for the future um mm. but uh you know when when adventure illustrated is not the second issue is finished um, you know, I've got some Morton Stone stuff that I'm doing. There's a um, Morton Stone uh, single issue collection that has stories by Jason Paulos, uh, Matthew Dunn, Ryan Vella, Dylan Naylor. Uh, so that um, will be packaged up and hopefully released before Christmas as well. And then my 2023 is looking pretty packed. And um, uh, the, the main thing for next year is um, the Jackaroo. So um, hopefully my my ability to draw will allow me to to at least start that whole exercise of getting the Jackaroo adventures up and running again. And uh, you know, if if needs be, drawing on, not drawing on, bringing in help from friends and other artists as well to finish the job off. But uh, I think um, once that gets started, I'll be in such a happy place seeing new adventures of the Jackaroo that it might go on for a while. So that's the plan. Yeah, I um, I, I like that. It's um. I like the fact that you're staying busy and you're doing those things, man, because um, it's, uh, no, it's a great thing, man. Like, to me, you've been um, a trailblazer from when I was a kid, you know, knowing who you were and stuff and your crew um, and what you just did and all that. And, um, yeah, and through the 90s and, and 2000s, I've always known who Gary Challoner is. And um, it's, uh, yeah, man, it's um, one of those lucky things for me you know like to be able to like uh call you a mate you know like um and getting to talk to you and stuff and um letting you talk you know just doing what i hope 
Chinwag does make is, you know, like allowing people like yourself to tell their stories and just have a yarn and stuff, mate, and pass on their advice to people. And, yep. and you know, like there's a lot of, there's a lot of history in Australian comic books and stuff. And, um, you know, like, and you're a major part of it, mate. So, uh, you know, yeah, well, respect, man. You know, hopefully, uh, you know, Chinwag, you'll get some, uh, some interesting and, and deep conversations, uh, casual fun conversations over the next couple of weeks as well. But I'll, I'd like to come back when the Cyclone book's out to sort of um, pick that apart as well, because I'm sure there might be a few people interested in uh, once it's out and the people have had a read, uh, you know, go, go through that as well. Um, Gary, you are welcome back, mate, anytime you want. You just tell me when you want to come back, mate, and um, it's uh, you're the man as far as I'm concerned. No it's It's... Yeah, good. it's uh, yeah. Yeah, um, but oh, I think uh, next year is going to be a big year for comics in general. Yeah. Not not yeah. just the Dakaru stuff, notwithstanding. But there's, oh, I know for a fact that there's a lot of stuff happening next year that's uh, you know pretty exciting. And uh, you know, not not just my projects, but what I've heard around the traps that's coming up in the next twelve months. Uh, so yes, yeah, it's, it's an interesting time to be in comics, and that's just at at the level of of uh, you know professional uh, floppies and things that I know about let alone the, the the zine shows that are coming and the conventions are coming back online again and the, the graphic novels that have been picked up by overseas publishers that will get released across the year it's it's just all growing and it's all you know pretty bloody exciting and uh peter lane's just um sent a comment through mate saying what a great interview and inspirational trap chat so awesome Thank awesome you, stuff. yeah 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 no worries um, yeah man um all right. Well, we might wind it up, mate. I don't want to. I certainly don't want to, but um, I'd keep I've talking. I've still got plenty to talk about. Yeah. Well, mate, I'm willing if you want to keep talking. I'm happy to. I'm happy to keep rolling, brother. It's uh, it's entirely up to you. So. Um, well, yeah. no, it's your show. It's your call, man. What, what are we up to? Two and a half hours. Uh, we're we'll, we'll going to always do a part two at some stage, so we'll, we'll leave it at that, shall we? Let people go to bed. Right. Well, are, are you happy with leaving it at that? Yeah. All right. No worries. All right. Well, everyone that's watched, uh, viewers and everyone, thank you very much uh, for joining us at Tuesday Chinwag. Uh, the show is sponsored by the Comics Network. Um, Monday nights there's Aussie verse. Tuesday night Chinwag. Friday night there's uh, drink and draw with guests and heaps of artists get together and uh, you know draw characters. So uh, if anyone out there wants to get onto the Friday night drink and draw, contact Comex. Um, you know, like and feel free. We are a community here and do encourage positivity and people get out there. Um, and other than that. Mate, Gary Challoner, always a pleasure, mate. You are an absolute legend. So thank you very much, man. And uh, no and next week we have Spedzy coming on for the Friday, uh, the Tuesday Chinwag. So we'll see uh, what makes Mr. Lyle tick. Until then, thank you, yes, everyone. Spedzy, let's see. Two, two, two hours, 37 minutes. Uh, Spedzy's going to have to talk for a bit longer than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spence will probably give it a good shot, though, mate. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> you probably won't have to turn it up. You won't have yeah. to turn it up. <laughs> mate, I'll, I'll just one, one screen, man. One screen. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, good night to all of you, and thank you very much. We'll see you later. And remember, community is unity. Thank you. This show is sponsored by the Comics Shop. Check out comex.cx for all things comex and find out what comex is all about. Then head over to comex.shop to pick up a variety of Australian comics from multiple creators and publishers, all for one flat postage rate. And don't forget to check out the Comex channel on YouTube. We hope you enjoy.